Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's seminar, both here in the Wallenberg Auditorium in Stockholm and also to all of you who are following us online. My name is Tuula Teri and I'm the president of EVA, the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences. We are the first engineering academy in the world, which we are very proud of. We have been active for about 100 years, a little bit more. Uh, with the vision, uh, technology in the service of humanity, and I think that the theme of this uh, today's seminar is also very much in, in line of that kind of thinking. And we also think, uh, especially now, uh, maybe uh, past uh, 20, 30 years, uh, that uh, the re only reasonable grounds for future competitiveness is sustainable development. And when I talk with our industrial networks, uh, this is also a, a, a thinking which is shared quite broadly in the Swedish industries as well, so we have a joint agenda there. We are a national academy, but we have always taken pride in embracing also international perspectives, and we have very broad international networks, and I know that the universities, of course, are also very international these days, so we are uh, uh, having this seminar in English for that purpose today. I look really forward to an inspiring sem seminar about what is required of the materials that will uh, ensure a well-functioning energy system. In other words, we will be addressing the issues at the center of sustainable transition that is just beginning, or I hope that it is accelerating at the moment. So when Eva uh, turned 100 years 2019, we had quite a lot of seminars on new materials. And today's seminar is very much linked to those same themes. We will get a lot of uh, uh, several ex examples, actually, from the, from the research front. And it's really uh, a pleasure to look at you know, the very rapid development that has happened in only four years uh, after uh, 2019, when we last had a really strong focus on this, this area. So we will meet uh, scientists within KTH materials and energy research platforms, as I have understood. The specialists from industry and other sectors of society will also join the discussions when and how the research can be of practical use in different activities. Myself, I have a background as a professor at KTH, and I was working with the development of bio-based materials so I'm particularly pleased that Ulrika Edlund and Lisa Bartling, Shanberry, both EVA members as well, have taken this initiative for this collaboration between KTH and EVA. And EVA naturally welcomes all higher education institutions in Sweden to various collaborations. Together we can really make a difference. So again, warm welcome to today's seminar where material science is going to be central. And I will now hand over to our four moderators who will guide us through the day. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome. My name is Jonas Weissenrinder, <laughs> and uh, I'm director of the materials platform at KTH. And here we have uh, Ulrike Edlund, or maybe you want to introduce yourself, Christoph yeah, Daun. Christoph Dudik from Energy Platform. Mm. And Lina backling kjernberg from the Energy Platform. And Ulrike is Vice Director of the Materials Platform. So uh, today's uh, seminar will be also broadcasted uh, on the internet. So uh, for those of you following us online, mm -hmm. you can uh, put your questions in the chat and we will monitor it during all the sessions and then pick up questions if uh, those arrive there. But we, and <coughs> we will also take questions from the auditorium, of course, and then to make sure that the sound goes, for, uh, goes out into uh, the, also the online session. Please use the microphone that you have uh, next to your seat. And turn it on also, please. <laughs> so the materials platform at KTH is an organization within KTH, where uh, at KTH we have five different schools. And, and materials research is very active on all five of those schools. 
So we are uh, working as a bridge between all the schools, joining activities to make sure that we know what is going on at the different schools in materials research. We are, can also serve, for those of you who are not a kid yet, as a contact point uh, for uh, if you want to be in contact with a researcher or any other person of interest at KTH, we can be of serve as a first point, entry, uh, entry point. So we, uh, we have uh, organized similar activities as this uh, every year, and we also have some internal calls and stuff. And you can, in the, at the link in the bottom of the page here, um, you can find our, uh, our uh, portal. So, and then Lina, would you like to present the energy platform briefly? Okay, so very happy to see you all here and also everyone that's attending Digital. So Christophe and I, uh, we are leading what we call the energy platform at KDH. And it's an inclusive forum for everyone interested in applications in energy. That could be material uh, science that we will discuss specifically today. And we are targeting, uh, everything we do are targeting to achieve the sustainable development goals that you can see here. And we have one event that's going annually uh, that we call KDH Energy Dialogue. And this year it will be on the 30th of November when you're welcome to join us at KDH. We are always um, at home at KDH at that event. And there we have exhibitions and, and show our differences in, in um, energy research. Um, so we are also having a lot of communication, of course, with society. And as we know, we will discuss today, it's a lot of very actual uh, topic on, on energy. Uh, and you will find more information on our website here. So we can take the next page, please. And last year, we had a very, uh, very interesting event. And Christoph can tell us a little bit more. Yeah, <coughs> and it's not only us. It's actually quite a few researchers, 13 of KTH. And we tried to write a book for everybody to be read. So the level is basically what you expect from a, a high school level. They don't have to be specialists, but you can still enjoy the reading. And we collaborated with an organization, VNA, which is actually in the same building here, who helps us to make it accessible to everybody. And the book, you can just go here and download it online for free, or you can buy it in any bookstore. So it's uh, available for reading for everybody. Yes, thank you. So then we are happy to start the program for today. And we are very happy to have a lot of very distinguished speakers with us. So mm. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And we should also add that this uh, seminar is being recorded and can be viewed afterwards at the EVA homepage or on YouTube, where you can find actually all EVA seminars in the past. So if you have a friend or a colleague who unfortunately couldn't join us today, please let them know that they can view it afterwards. Also, if you, for some reason, cannot attend throughout the program today, make sure that you uh, check in later to see what you missed in the interesting discussions that we will have today. Heartfelt welcome to everybody. So then I would be happy to invite to this uh, stage our first invited speaker, uh, which is Ulla uh, Samborg. And she is today uh, CEO of Jokkmokk uh, Iron. So it's a mining uh, industry. And she has also very long, uh, different experience from industry. And specifically, I'm very proud that she was the general director of the National Grid uh, before. So I think it's a perfect uh, match for us to start up the seminar today with a mixture from material uh, from the mining side and energy. Uh, and she's also have a background from KDH and is a member of, she's a, um, in the EVA and the Division Two Electrical Engineering. So very welcome, uh, Ulla. Thank you. <laughs> Great to be here and um, especially to talk about two of my favorite topics, both energy and supply of materials. It's lovely. And uh, Jokmok Iron Mines, I can understand that you probably not heard about it, but we are a startup in mining. We're going to open a mine in Kalak. Uh, it's 40 kilometers uh, west of Jokmok. It's above the Polar Circle. Uh, this deposit was found in the 40s by the Geological Survey of Sweden. It's a very fine deposit. I will come back to that. Uh, I will talk about iron ore, but also about other metals and minerals that's needed for the energy transition. 
So the goal for us, uh, since we are a greenfield mine, as I said, uh, to be a modern and sustainable from the start. And um, uh, the starting point is, of course, to be a part of the chain to fossil-free steelmaking. If you don't have fossil-free iron ore, you can't say that you have fossil-free or green steel. And this is a very important thing for the future. And we do have a lot of uh, companies working with uh, fossil-free or green steel, uh, both in Norway and Finland and Sweden and the rest of Europe. Everybody's talking about this, even though we are in Sweden sort of leading this um, step. Um, are four reasons. I often have to talk about why are we opening a new mine. I will come back to that. But um, of course, the size that was found in the 40s, you can see the green areas, that's our uh, deposits. And the blue one is where we have a, a concession, exploitation concession now. And um, we do, do have several deposits in the area. The quality, the iron can be extracted to 7.5% fines. That's very high. And why do we need to do this, this high? It's because of the green transition. I mean, when you're going to extract the iron in the steel factory, you need a high grade of this ore. So it's very good. The need on the market, well, we start way back when we had windmills, not that much need of metals and minerals. But we are moving a lot towards many more needs. We need a lot of minerals for the transition and the market, Sweden, Europe, the rest of the world, needs, has a new, huge need for sustainable mining of iron ore. Iron ore is a part of this. Um, we also do this to grow the city of Jokkmokk. Uh, it's a huge area with very few inhabitants. 4,600 people are living there. And we could provide 250 jobs and also additional for round surrounding jobs. Uh, we did a study together with Copenhagen Economics some years ago. That's why we found this. It's nothing I just say. So we have uh, explored this one. I think it's also the first picture, the size. It says that we are going to be there for several years and not just doing one mine and then leave the area. So it's going to be for plus 30 years. Um, I borrowed this picture. This is an open pit, and we are going to open an open pit. You may think this is not so beautiful, but it's not a huge area, and <laughs> Norrbotten is a huge area. So, and of course, we're going to restore the area after us. We borrowed this from uh, Kaunis Iron, and uh, we did a comparison study with them. Uh, what happened in the, the city of Pajala when they reopened the mine in 2018? This can happen in Jokkmokk as well. Um, we got an exploitation concession after nine years from the government. We had to wait nine years for that. Uh, so we got it in March last year. And now we're working with the environmental permit, very important. So just this minute, people are out in the woods looking for animals and plants, fishes, everything. And we actually found a bear the other day. Exciting, <laughs> I must say. And um, when you open a mine, you have to do this environmental impact assessment twice. First for the um, exploitation concession, and now for the environmental concession, according to the mineral law and to the environmental code. Um, the ambition we have, I've been talking a bit about this, to build a very efficient mine in Kallak by using experience, research, and modern technologies, and do this in a very innovative way. Um, and as I told you, we have a very high quality, so this is important for the world. Um, we will run the operation with a huge respect to the environment, the nature, the culture, but also the reindeer husbandry. Half the land of Sweden is uh, reindeer husbandry land. So we, of course, we are in the middle of this, in the north also. But as I said, we want to be a natural part of the development of Jokma together with partners. We talk a lot with the companies up there, and we're going to partner up with several of them. And last but not least, we will restore the area after the mining 
to create conditions for biodiversity, but also very high nature values. What is sustainable mining? What do we mean? Uh, I put in electrified mining, of course, modern sustainable electrified mining. We will use innovations. Um, for instance, you can use bio-based flotation today. You don't have to use all methods. And that's one of the good things for us. We're opening up a new mine. You don't have to use something old. You can do the stuff from the start, and we can also try new techniques. Carbon-free, of course, digitalized and autonomous mining. And autonomous uh, battery charging, of course, also. One thing is very important, to minimize the energy consumption, but also the water consumption. And this is possible today with new techniques. Uh, you can use, um, in grinding, new methods to do this. I mean, the world is always now trying to get more and more sustainable solutions, and we can use them now. It's very important also the social thing, the social uh, respect, to have a good dialogue with the society and landowners and the land users, as I told you about the reindeer herding. Careful use of land, even though we are situated in a deforest area. Um, I think it could be much better when we leave. Um, sustainable electrified transportation, so we are talking about uh, railroads and uh, also in the mine, we're going to use electrical vehicles, of course. And then the responsible mine closure. So now that's our ambitions for this. And the sustainable mining. Um, shortly, you have probably seen this. I mean, the difference between a blast uh, furnace process and hybrid. It's, of course, the, the fossil free. Um, uh, not using coal uh, and not bringing on more carbon dioxide. And the starting point, the triangle, is iron ore concentrate that is also sustainable produced. Um, it's a huge demand of electricity. And I don't dare to say how much, because I've seen so many figures, and we don't know who's going to start their factories. It's H2 Green Steel, it's no fault. It's the mines, it's hybrids. Everybody needs more electricity. And of course, it's a huge uh, challenge up in the north and everywhere. And we also need water for the production of this, but I think we have a lot of that in the north of Sweden also. Um, just a short example of end products for this uh, transition. I mean, where you use uh, steel, wind, water turbines, <laughs> solar panels, high voltage poles, electrical vehicles, railways. I mean, if you don't have steel, and if it's not produced in a sustainable way, you won't manage the transition. I'm going to change a bit to other materials. Um, the batteries. This is not steel. Uh, it's a lot of other materials, of course. And um, um, these materials are also, of course, used for storage of electricity. We need that. We need to find ways of storing our wind and solar for the future. I know that lots of people are working with this research. It's very important. Um, if we put us up a bit higher up, we would like to see what, what is happening in, in the European Union then. Um, we realize that we have a new geopolitical situation with war close to us. We have the green transition, there's nothing new that's happening now. And we also had the COVID-19 when we found out that transportation was difficult. It was hard to get our material to be self-sufficient in the countries or in Europe. So on the 16th of March 2023, the European Commission proposed a set of actions. It's called the uh, Critical Raw Materials Act. Uh, and this is to ensure the supply for Europe and also the sustainable supply of uh, critical raw materials. Well, this is essential. We need these in order to uh, do our transition. Um, they launch lists of materials, and it's important. The, this, they are not classified as critical because they are scarce. Uh, they have a significant economic importance for key sectors. So, of course, the economy drives this as well. 
uh, but they also have a high risk uh, of supply, high supply risk. Uh, we are dependent on import, and that's harder and harder in, in these uh, times with uh, geopolitical issues. Um, and there is a lack of um, substitutes. Some of these materials can be done in another way, but many of them can't. They are unique, and um, we need these uh, minerals. And I want to show you the list. Uh, these are the 34 lists of the critical raw materials. The list was first launched in 2011, and uh, they launch a list every third year. And this is the proposal now. And you can see copper and nickel. That's a bit surprising, but that's because they are strategic to the future and the battery industry, of course. Um, and in Sweden, we do have some of these, but not all of them. But it's, it's what's interesting to see LKAB that found, and um, they had a media regarding a new mine, the Per Geier, up in Kiruna for rare earth uh, elements. And this is what's needed. And you set, they set up a benchmark for 30, 2030 uh, for domestic capacities, and they will monitor each country to see that we fulfill our goals, the sort of goals for Europe. And at least 10% of the consumption for extraction should be in here, in, the, uh, in Europe and 40% of the construction for processing. And then it's very in interesting to see they also set up a, a goal for uh, recycling with 15%. And I often get the question, why haven't we enough iron for recycling? Why do we need a new mine? Because the demand is so high, I'd say. And um, the last bullet point is no more than 65% of our annual consumption for a single, from a single third country. And today it's China that we have so much import from, and also Russia, South Africa, many countries. But Europe has set a, a, a goal to, to leave this. Last but not least, I'd like to push for this very good initiative from IVA, the project Roadmap for Metals and Minerals to talk about extraction. We need more mines. In Sweden, there are 12 mines. And one is, uh, has the permit to open, so we'll be 13. And the last one was opened 12 years ago. Circular flows, we need to explore that more um, and put it in new materials with old materials. And then the political and public acceptance is very crucial to be able to open these mines. And um, the project will continue uh, next year as well. So we, in this industry, are very interested in what's happening with the project. And that's about what I wanted to say. So then we would like to welcome questions from the audience here or from the digital audience. So, any questions? You have a mic in your chair. Uh, maybe I can start with a question. So, you mentioned that it took nine years yeah. to get the permission. Yeah. Uh, do you have a, any feeling on how it is in other countries? I think we are definitely not the best in class. No? no. Um, and we have so many authorities in Sweden that has to say mm -hmm. in this. And especially when you talk about reindeer herding and mineral uh, extraction, they collide in this, these uh, areas. Mm -hmm. And the authorities have not a clear guidance. Mm. So that's why it went to the government a couple of times until uh, the decision was taken. Yeah. So do you think there are, p how, do you have a feeling of how we could be reduced in, in future? Positive? Yeah. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. uh, the commission set up goals. Mm -hmm. Extraction can yeah. only take two years, and I just like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, but of course, we have to have a process where people are involved, mm -hmm. and the society gets to mm -hmm. uh, have their say. And uh, but they set a goal for 24 months. Okay. 
yeah. That's cool. <laughs> so maybe we, we can use that, I don't know, yeah. for the future. Yes. Okay, any questions? Naya, please. Please say who you are. Uh, thank you. Is it mm. on? Oh, it's yeah. on. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, um, how shall I put it? Uh, you guarantee, I guess, nine years is because everyone is concerned of the environmental. And the guarantee is that you will, when you leave after 50 years, that the place is rebuilt. How I, do you save money for every? I just I'm just curious. Oh yeah, yeah. You have Otherwise, to <laughs> if you go bankruptcy, there's no one there in 50 years. Exactly. So Sweden has uh, <laughs> done this before. So we actually have to fund money uh, to be able to restore the area. So I think it's a very good model that we have, and we also have it in our permission um, to to permit the permit we have. Uh, so we have to do that, and every mines had to do that. It has to do that in Sweden. Uh, in different countries, it's not like this. But I think it's important that we take care of what we have caused. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Any more questions from yes. the audience? Yes, yes please. Yeah, Jürgen Federsel from RICE and fellow of IVA, chemistry department. Uh, when you start a project like this, a lot of investments need to be done and you will have to compete on a very tough market with a, a commodity, iron. It's a commodity material. How much do you factor in the financial situation? I mean, you are talking about something you will produce several years from now. You have to make some projections. You have to have some kind of a tipping point when it's not uh, sustainable anymore mm. from a financial point of view. Mm. So it would be interesting to hear how you have handled this kind of tough question. Thank yeah. you. It's a very good question. Uh, of course, it's a challenge because you're talking about something that's coming far ahead of us. And the way you do it, you do it stepwise. You do a scoping study and you explore the economics of the mine and you uh, do it finer and finer and then you do a, we're going to start a pre-feasibility study now and then you show the market uh, this is the money we're going to make according to i mean iron ore is very there are standards and also um, what is the price for the future it's not set by us of course because then every mine should be <laughs> very good but uh, so it's the way you do it. You do a scoping study, you do a pre-feasibility study, then you do a banking study in the end for the building the mine. So it's a stepwise approach. And some people say, hey, you don't have all the money now. No, I couldn't have all the money now. No one will give me all the money now. I have to take this stepwise. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions from there? No. Okay, so then I think we will like to thank you for this very nice speech. And Ooh. then I'm handing over a book from us to you. Thank, thank you, you, very you much. so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, so then we're moving up to the next session. Yes. And uh, I will take over for a while. Uh, let's see. Oops. Yes, maybe I should. Yeah, no, it's here. Oh, so this session is on uh, heterogeneous catalysis. And uh, I have first asked, uh, or we have first asked uh, Anders Nilsson from Stockholm University to come and explain why this is of so importance, big importance for a sustainable uh, future, especially for the energy system, and also for very high relevance to our previous speaker here, where they would like to use hydrogen to refine the uh, iron ore. So, and the hydrogen will, of, should of course be produced through heterogeneous catalysis. So, Anders is one of the world leading experts in this field. He is now a professor at Stockholm University, but also has substantial activities at Stanford Universities, and is a pioneer in using advanced in instrumentation techniques like uh, free electron lasers and synchrotron radiation to really pinpoint what are the uh, molecular. Um, <coughs> uh, molecular level uh, reaction, uh, the, the reactions at the molecular level that takes place on a very complex 
catalytic surface. So please come up, uh, Anders, and I'm looking forward to your talk. I'll give you. <coughs> so I will show Thank you very much. With five minutes left. <laughs> show like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here to talk today at this very interesting meeting about uh, sustainable material science for the energy sector. And um, let's see if I get this to work. No? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm doing mostly very fundamental science, and, and Jonas has asked me to give a little bit more uh, broader perspective on, on the issue of catalysis for the future. And, uh, <coughs> and I will, at the end, bring in a little bit science in it, because many of these questions actually require a lot of knowledge of fundamental science. And it, it's an area that goes all the way from understanding fundamental science system on an electronic level to, to engineering, so to speak. And I will gear towards my favorite topic, more fundamental science. And I will make a comment a little bit about some aspect I've been part of in the US when, when it comes to this uh, type of question, so to speak. Um, I start with a historical outlook, because I don't think many people know about this, that we had a crisis more than 100 years ago in the world. And this is actually Sir William, let's see if I press the right bottom here. This is Sir William Crookes. He was the incoming president of the British Physical Society. And he, in his inauguration speech, he started with the world, the world is doomed. And the reason for this was that at that time, agriculture was done by a very inefficient method. And people have discovered to make fertilizer, and the fertilizer was imported as saltpeter from Chile. And there was not enough saltpeter for the world, and they have estimated that the world can only sustain 1.5 billion people. And they were, they were estimating mass starvation in the 1920s to come. Um, and they anticipated a major war to play out about this um, commodity to have their access to saltpeter. Um, and it's interesting also how the British shipping industry uh, uh, answered to that and said, oh, no, no, they had a big economic financial interest in shipping from Chile, and they didn't want to see too much development. They wanted to maintain their financial, let's say, income, uh, whereas Germany got really alarmed because they realized in case of a war, the British Navy will blockade all import of saltpeter and they will have mass starvation. So um, he said that the world, uh, the chemist needs to save humanity, was what he said. And actually, I changed it to surface scientist needs to save the humanity, because what it actually led to is catalysis. And uh, it's many of you are um, familiar with what's called the Haber-Bosch process, uh, it was an enormous activity in Germany in the beginning of the 1900s. And it was first Fritz Haber that discovered that you could take nitrogen from the gas and make ammonia. Nitrogen is one of the most stable molecules we have, so it's very difficult, it's very inert. That's why you often call uh, uh, nitrogen to be, yeah, uh, sort of you can suffocate if you get too much nitrogen. So that actually is involving then catalysis on the surface. And this process itself has led to three Nobel Prizes. But no one has yet, actually, I will come to that, study actually what's happening on the surface during this process. To give the perspective here, this is a plot of the world population here and the consumption of uh, um, fertilizer produced by, uh, through the Haber-Bosch process. So it's been estimated that this process alone has saved two to three billion people's lives. Uh, uh, and uh, it was selected by Nature, the journal Nature, in 2001 as the most important scientific, scientific discovery in the 20th century because it provided the whole development, industrial development that we have seen because without this, most of us would not have been born today that sit in this room. And secondly, most people have been, would have still been farmers because they made the efficiency in farming. And there's an interesting plot here. This is the world population as it developed. And without Haber-Bosch, it would have developed like this. Of course, there are many side effects of, of this process and environmental and so on. And it's also an ongoing discussion 
uh, how to make this more efficient and more uh, environmental friendly for, for it, so to speak. Now today, as we all know, this is a picture from Al Gore's movie. We have a challenge uh, with the world of uh, climate ch change. And I had the pleasure actually to be at Stanford when Al Gore came and gave his talk that became the movie. It was one of the most amazing talk I ever heard from anyone actually. He captured several thousand people completely in, in this talk. Um, and if you now go to the chemical industry, now so, so, suddenly my slides are in Swedish, sorry. Um, maybe that's appropriate for this <laughs> audience. Uh, today, when we are actually uh, generating um, a lot of materials um, uh, from the chemical industry point of view, all the way from uh, fuels for transportation, agriculture, materials for plastic, etc., detergent and pharmaceutical, we are using fossil sources. It's gas and oil that is used for that. And actually, the chemical industry itself, not counting when we burn fossils, just to produce everything, stands for 8% of the CO2 emission in the world. It's the same amount, actually, as the steel industry all around the world. So this is as big a challenge as the steel industry, I would say. And, um, and so we need to create a new future. And it's similar to the steel industry. Um, to come from elect electrical uh, energy, so to speak. And uh, many of the reactions that are involved in, in, in this production is hydrogenation reactions that occur at high pressure and high temperature. And, and so the need is to again use solar and wind to actually make what we call an e-refinery uh, and then use water, CO2 and N2 and then produce everything from that. Um, so that's the big challenge. Um, and uh, oh, this slide got completely corrupted here when I <laughs> sent it over, obviously. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, but you have, to look, you have to look at it now <laughs> a little bit in this direction. Uh, so you can do catalysis in two different ways uh, here, with using hydrogen or, or uh, electrical energy, so to speak. Uh, of course, the most interesting would be to do what we call electrocatalysis, that you would actually produce these uh, commodities, all the chemicals we need to build up, the base chemicals that then build up the whole chemi chemical industry directly uh, by using feeding CO2 and uh, water and into an electrolyzer and so on. And, and, and this is, of course, an ongoing research area, very much. Um, but you can also produce the hydrogen through electrolysis, similar for the steel industry, and, and then use thermal catalysis for, for producing all, all what is needed here. Um, however, today we are using, we are getting a lot of the hydrogen for the chemical industry from natural gas. And, and, and the industry is, you are used, as you probably know, big chemical plants, and a lot of it is because you need very high pressure of hydrogen. And the reason you need a high pressure of hydrogen is because the reaction often operates at high temperature, and, and therefore it's from a thermod chemical thermodynamics simply the equilibrium that you need a high uh, pressure to get enough yield for, for this reaction to occur. Um, but the goal and what will be envisioned here is that you could usually get about 10 bar from an electrolyzer. It's not that difficult to get uh, that pressure. And you would like to have a chemical industry that can make use of 10 bar. And that requires a new type of catalyst that can operate at lower temperature and these lower pressures. And then we are not going to need these huge chemical plants any longer. We can more build up more smaller units, delocalized units, uh, and we might be less, uh, let's say, dependent on uh, global <coughs> transportation for many aspects. We can more delocalize uh, manufacturing because I think one area that is often forgotten in, in, in this discussion about sustainability is also resilience. We need to create a society that is resilient against disturbance. And we saw that in the, in the global pan pandemic now, that, that many uh, ways of shipping and, and transporting things were shut down in the world. And, 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 and that, all that disturbance uh, we are still um, affected by with the, right now, mostly through the inflation. So we need also to create something where we can localize 
many productions and generation in smaller units. That's what I think is very important to be more resilient for disturbances. Um, I was at a meeting in 2019 in Brussels. There was a plan then for a big energy hub uh, in catalysis, which didn't because the EU decided not to continue these uh, hubs, or actually it was not called hub, it was called something else. Hub was in the US. Um, I can't remember the name now. <laughs> um, and it was really to invest in, in this vision of a new chemical industry in Europe based on, on, on these sources. And there gave a talk, was the research director of Shell. And um, I made up these slides myself, what I remember from his talk, and it was uh, a vision as Shell realized that they can no longer build the future of their chemical industry based on fossil sources. And this was an envision of a big, met big methanol plant here, in maybe in the Sahara Desert, that will produce 10,000 ton methanol per day. And, and it will be then an array, in this case, of 10 by 10 kilometer solar cells and one by one kilometer CO2 captures. Uh, and uh, with this, of course, again, you need new catalysts for, for this process to, to work more efficiently. Um, so in, it's interesting that, maybe I should go back and just a comment here, that um, in Sweden right now there is a, also a company, a startup company called Liquid Wind, that are planning to, to do this for now, instead of using the wind energy, as we just heard also here, that uh, all the wind farms up in the north, of course, for the production of hydrogen can also be used instead of, of solar cells. So this is an opportunity for Sweden to further uh, use the wind energy uh, to generate this. And there is also a startup company I know in Sweden called NitroCap that is planning to do similar things for the Harbour Bosch process to, to get the hydrogen instead also for, for, for that, so to speak. How much time do I have left, Jonas? 20 minutes, so I have so much time, yes. okay, all right. So let me just take a little bit step into the fundamentals. So we need to understand many of these processes on a fundamental level, either what is happening from, from uh, to generate electrochemical, so to speak, uh, fuels in this case here, where you actually have a proton transfer, an electron transfer, and you have all this reaction taking place on surfaces, or you can do it with the thermal process here. Let me get, give a comment a little bit about um, when I was in the US, um, there were many big projects generated in, in this area. And when um, uh, President Obama, uh, when he started, and he then gave uh, as the new energy secretary, Steve Shu, who was a Nobel laureate and also professor at Stanford at the time, he, he had the vision to start these energy hubs, um, to be massive investment in um, in, in solving uh, important energy-related uh, questions for the future. And the first three of them, one of them was actually exactly this. He f foresaw that uh, the importance was going to, gen to be able to generate uh, chemicals and fuels from CO2. So that was actually one of the first ones he started, and it was called Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis, and it was given to California, the state of California, with Berkeley, Stanford, and Caltech to, to be part of that. Um, and um, so that uh, resulted a lot of fundamental science, and I think we're seeing some, something that is coming out of that in terms of electrolyzer for, for using CO2. Um, the other big program, that I also was part of was actually President Bush hydrogen initiative, uh, of course, um, and and uh, we 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 actually got started on on doing fuel cell research in that program, uh, looking at very fundamental science, and one of the things we we did was to look at platinum that is used is often let's say, called the oxygen reduction reaction in fuel cell is the limiting factor that requires a lot of uses of platinum. Um, and it was th thought that the limit of platinum was, not, was limiting the possibility of fuel cell cars because you have to use too much platinum. So in that research program, we actually developed a way to strain platinum. And it's interesting, it's a little bit like engineering of the electronic structure of platinum, the D electrons, how narrow or sharp the D band is. And, and by 
changing and modifying the D-band in platinum, we changed in a way how these different species bonded on the surface. And we did it by de-alloying a copper platinum alloy by removing copper uh, from the surface through an electrochemical process. And that re generated a strain platinum film that it then became five times more active than pure platinum. And that resulted in that you only need five times less platinum. And that principle is now used by Toyota in their Mirage car for their catalyst. They, instead of using copper, they're using cobalt. But it's a, it's a principle how fundamental science can actually, in this case, of, on an electronic structural level of a material, can actually then affect the whole uh, production and, and, and eventually re resulting in, in, um, in, um, in a new uh, product, so to speak, and a new, new system. So this is a little bit of a comment why this is very important for us to really understand many of these processes on surfaces. And just to illustrate from a chemical point of view, um, if we are having us in putting in a CO molecule and a hydrogen molecule, and then we're doing catalysis to form methane, methanol, or ethanol. And this is a theoretical calculation of possible reaction pathways. It's a completely spaghetti. It is actually 100 different molecular states in here, 200 reaction steps, and there are 2,000 unique reaction pathways. And how this is occurring will depend on the catalyst surface itself, different sites on it. You have a different materials. You can have then different metals. In this case, it's going to be metals. And it can have then uh, different uh, alloys also, where you have therefore generate a lot of different sites. And all of this will change depending on what you have. And um, it's, it's, a lot of this field is now driven because of with machine learning, advanced computation. But still, we don't know the accuracy of these uh, computations and, and the experimental tools to really look at these processes on a fundamental level is uh, of extremely importance, in my opinion. And so we need methods that can look at these with chemical sensitivity, surface sensitivity, work under realistic conditions. It's been the field of surface science that's done a lot of studies in vacuum. We need now to do this under reaction real conditions at higher pressures. And we also need to detect what I call the transient phenomena, because many of these reaction steps here actually involves um, transient species that might have a very short lifetime. And therefore, also, you need to look at things very fast. We are talking about femtoseconds level. And Jonas mentioned also free electron laser we are doing. That's one of the reasons to get access to these tra transient species, to really see them, because they might be the important ones. Uh, they just exist under such a short time. And many of these uh, reaction steps can also be important when you actually are hydrogenating iron oxide. How much do we understand that, actually, on the fundamental level? How are the, the, all these different steps happening in, in, in the reduction of hydrogen uh, iron oxide and different type of iron oxide, different steps, different impurities that's playing a role there, mixing together and so on. So that, I'm sure there is a lot of research needed in that area as well, um, so to speak. Um, let me skip that. So just go a little bit into the technique that we developed, so to speak, and working with uh, substantially, and Jonas is also someone who is active in this field, um, is to use X-ray foot electron spectroscopy to look at surfaces species. And so now I'm going a little bit more back into this basic science, and maybe some of you might lose me here. This technique is interesting also because it was originally developed in Uppsala, and Kai Siegmann received the Nobel Prize 1981 for the development of X-ray foot electron spectroscopy. Uh, I was his starting as his last student, actually. <laughs> um, so we developed in, in, in Stockholm when I came um, from, from the US and got a very big uh, access of, of uh, funding to take a step to develop this technique, not any longer in vacuum. And we develop an instrument that we can actually generate a very high pressure region on the surface here uh, where we are taking out the ele electron. And that allowed us 
to go up with two orders of magnitude higher pressure in this technique, and that will open up the door to look at these important reactions like hydrogenation to generate methanol or ammonia. Yes, maybe I didn't mention that the annual production of methanol is 100 million ton per year. This is big industry. Ammonia is ha also 100 million ton per year. And just the ammonia process itself takes roughly around 2% of all energy consumption in the world and 50% of all the uh, energy consumption for agriculture industry, actually. So it, it's, it's huge. And so coming back to this Haber-Bosch process, uh, that is something that we just now could start to look at what is actually happening on the surface. And, and the catalyst that uh, was developed for this is iron. Um, and iron is not the most active, but it's used because it's so cheap. And I learned by talking with the, uh, the company CEO of uh, Haldo Topsa, who is the, in Denmark, who is the main producer of ammonia synthesis catalyst. And since you mentioned the, the mining industry in Sweden, uh, it's interesting, he told me that one of the secrets was that during the Second World War, they had to start to buy the iron from, actually this, from, from the Swedish mines. And it turns out that the iron in the Swedish mine has the right impurities. Uh, not that the impurities participate in the reaction, but it structurally made iron after reduction to, to look different. And that maybe points also that this could be something fundamental, also important for, for, for the steel industry and eventually to do. So I'm, um, so to speak, the, the fundamental question that has been existing in the literature is that when you have nitrogen and hydrogen reaction, what, what actually going to be the surface look like? Uh, since you start with iron oxide, many people have uh, proposed that, that it's still going to be an oxide. It's not fully reduced under these reaction conditions. Or there is a lot of oxide patches on it. Uh, other... Other uh, proposal has been that it's actually a bulk nitride, that the nitrogen then will dissociate and uh, generate a lot of, you know, generate a pretty much a bulk nitride, and the bulk nitride is the catalyst. Other people have suggested it's a surface nitride only. It's covered with a monolayer of nitrogen on the surface. And the least is that it's a metallic, pure metallic. And that has probably been the Danish school um, and um, led by Jens Norskog, who, who was also my colleague for a while at Stanford University. So we did this now. We actually, this is now a little bit complicated di diagram. It's time, and it's an XPS, X-ray photoelectron spectrum here. Uh, it's a binding energy, and we are looking at the nitrogen 1S line. And what we do here is that we are feeding only poor nitrogen, pure nitrogen in, in this, on iron here. It's an iron single crystal, where we have a specific facets of iron structurally, so to speak. And, um, and what you can see as time goes on, we are increasing two peaks here in the spectrum. And these are two different types of bulk nitrides. Uh, it's actually this gamma, sorry, am I going too fast? This is a gamma nit uh, iron nitride, and um, I'm not used to this um, controller here, gamma and epsilon nitride, and you see the, here the spectrum. That is generating the pure nitrogen, and we are talking about many, many layers of iron nitride generated. Then we suddenly switch, and we put in... 500 millibar of a mixture of nitrogen and hydrogen at 400 degrees. And instantaneous, instantaneous, in the first scan, all nitride disappeared. We hardly don't see anything. And we only, if we enlarge this a little bit, we can see a small amount of 3% of a monolayer of adsorbed nitrogen on the surface. So here's the question we actually identify now the active phase of the catalyst to be metallic uh, iron, pure metallic iron. So that question could be resolved. Then we could actually go and look at reaction conditions at different temperatures, and we could identify all the different species here. And we can then see, for instance, uh, how we have surface nitrogen, we have NH species, NH2, at different reactions and different uh, conditions. And uh, we can then build a picture. But 
what it turns out under real reaction condition, the surface is almost bare. It's only just a few layers of atomic nitrogen on the surface. And um, we can then actually go back to look at Gerard Ertel in his Nobel, laureate, Nobel lecture when he received in 2007 his Nobel Prize, very much motivated for fundamental studies of the ammonia synthesis, but in vacuum, not the under reaction conditions. Uh, we can then actually relate to this very much and identify that the system still has just a very small amount of nitrogen on the surface. It means that the rate-limiting step is the dissociation of nitrogen molecule in it. Um, and so that is... But we also see some of these species, and partially this is also the rate-limiting step. Because, let me go back just to comment here, because the most efficient catalyst for the hobby Bosch is not iron, it's ruthenium. And in ruthenium, it's only the, the rate limiting step being actually the end to dissociation. You see promille of species on the surface of ruthenium. The reason industry is not using ruthenium is too expensive, simply. And they often use it only at the end of the reactor, that catalyst, to make the conversion a little bit. Uh, more, so to speak, is it? Another area that we then addressed is the question of methanol, methanol synthesis. Um, and this is, as I said, a 100 million ton production. And what is used here is a catalyst that is a copper-zinc catalyst mixture. Actually, it's a copper together with zinc oxide. And often, of course, you have the copper oxide in it. And there's been an enormous debate in the literature, what is the nature of the zinc? And, and, and uh, there are a number of papers in very high-profile journals addressing, trying to address this question. Um, so this is an example, actually, of if we want to develop new catalysts, we have to fundamentally understand not only what we are generating by mixing components together, but what is the active state of it. And that you can only investigate under reaction conditions, so to speak. Um, so we could then actually look at the sink level here um, at, under real conditions. And depending on the gases you use, you can either use C or CO2. We can actually see that if you use CO, the sink is sitting in a metallic configuration. It's metallic sink. But if you use CO2, it's mostly... Um, uh, zinc oxide. And it's inter interesting that people know from isotope labeling that the methanol is mostly produced from CO2. But in industry, they have to mix in a mixture of CO. And we understand that now that the CO actually keeps the part of the zinc to be metallic. And um, we could also uh, look at specific details of these electronic structural levels of I'm not going to go into that in these spectra, so to speak, and arrive to that the sink is in a, br in, a, in a brass condition, and as well that we could use technique to see that it's actually on the surface. So we could, at the end, come up with a picture that what is actually the active catalyst is a copper sink alloy, and where the sink is alloyed in here on the surface. And we could then actually, by looking at the different intermediates, come up with a picture how the reaction is proceeding by detecting some of, some of these intermediates. So this is an example of detailed understanding for the uh, development of, of uh, catalysts, so to speak. And I think it's time for me to end. I just want to acknowledge a lot of people um, for the development of, of this, uh, first of all, this new instrument. And David Degeman, who you see there, is defending his thesis tomorrow, actually, <coughs> at Stockholm University. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Anders, for a very uh, impressive talk. Um, so now we have, um, can open the floor for, uh, and also the uh, online audience for, uh, for questions. If, uh, yeah, over there, please uh, use your microphone. Uh, my name is Mika Rose. I have a question regarding high temperature electrolysis. What is the status of the uh, solid oxide cell? 
that I am not an expert to answer, I think, on, 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 on the high uh, solar dioxide. So I have to, uh, I, I'm not an expert on that, so I, I shouldn't answer that question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question? Huh? Fascinating lecture. I just want to add one comment um, concerning the Harbour Bosch method and its impact. It, actually turns out that, I mean, this process has now been running for 100 plus years, as we know, and of our proteins, enzymes, whatever you have in your body, nitrogen is an essential element, and I don't remember the exact percentage, but it's stunning, 50% or something. Yes, I think it's 50%. That we have in ourselves is not from nature, with a big N, but it is from the Harbour Bosch process. So even uh, to sustain our life, lives, uh, we have to thank the Harbour Bosch process. It's not only for the food we have on our plates, but also how our bodies are built up. All our essential biochemical systems rely on the Harbour Bosch process. Maybe you have uh, further comments to that. I think it's fascinating. It is fascinating, and uh, it's m many people don't maybe um, realize this actually. That um, also the, the the fact that that we are sitting here and most of us is not out in the field and doing farming is due, due thanks to that. So now today, of course, there are a lot of interest to um, change the Haber Bosch process to to make a new modification. As you mentioned, it's a very established technique. It's not been so much research done actually in the last 100 years on this. There are coming up a lot of activities now for new catalysts. But one of the vision is to, to actually make it electrochemical production. In nature, actually, do this with a bacteria and with an enzyme called nitrogenase, which is more, an, uh, more a little bit more like an electrochemical process. It's not very energy efficient how nature does it, actually, but the nature doesn't need to produce the, the ammonia very fast, since nature acts often slowly. Um, but there are a lot of effort right now to do it, see if you can do it electrochemically, and the vision would be that you actually would produce the ammonia then in the fields and, and maybe mix it in in the irrigation water and other aspects. And, and not do it to put in the ammonia directly, so to speak, not via uh, making it into fertilizer. And you can envision to have uh, small solar cells, you know, that drives an electrolyzer, uh, small units uh, in, in, in agriculture field. There's an enormous effort needed to be done to realize that, though. It's not, the electrochemical process is not uh, easy. It's, it's still a very low efficiency, but people are making steps with a goal to, to reach that, actually. Yeah. Oh, Fredrik? Uh, Fredrik Lawell, KTH. Uh, Anders, I know your research is like a fundamental science, but uh, do you also have uh, industrial uh, collaborations, or is industry following what you are doing? Uh, we have uh, recently um, make steps to, to uh, see if we can generate some uh, collaborations with, uh, let's say, Halde Topse and some of the small startup companies in Sweden, yes, um, uh, to do it. But I am, of course, very much myself focused on the fundamental science, but I was pleased that the Toyota captured our actually idea of, of uh, changing platinum into that became the concept in, in the Mirai, Mirai car, so to speak. Uh, we have also done c uh, CO2 reduction electrochemical, where we discovered that you can restructure copper in a certain way. This is also work I did at Stanford. And, and that has led to actually using that, it Siemens is using that in electrolyzer now, it's, it's that type of concept. Not only developed by us, I should say, many other people are working on it, um, but to to, um, uh, to to generate ethylene actually in electrolyzer with CO2 and, and uh, electrical energy, so to speak. Because um, to reduce CO2, often you generate methane, and methane we have an abundance of as a natural gas, at, at least under normal, con normal world conditions. <laughs> um, 
but ethylene is a much more valuable product, and, and this restructured copper actually changed the selectivity towards ethylene instead of methane. So Siemens is also interested in that. Yeah. But I usually have been more, maybe I shouldn't say that in this forum, but I've been more in tied into fund understanding things on a fundamental level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, to keep our schedule, I think we have to uh, thank Anders again. Uh, very nice. And here you have one of his books. Oh, <laughs> so uh, our next speaker in this session on heterogeneous catalysis is uh, Joy Diptutta. Joy has a long career in electrochemistry, actually, that we discussed here recently. He has been professor uh, in Bangkok, Oman, and now since uh, 10 years almost, right, at KTH, uh, working on an, uh, not only what he is going to talk today, which is uh, membrane-free water splitting, but also in uh, water purification and others. So please come up, Joy. And Thank you very much. Give <laughs> Good morning. Uh, hydrogen is something that we all talk about because I don't have to convince you. This is, by the way, a year old slide. So I'll point out where uh, further development has happened. Like US recently decided to invest 9.5 billion. India, I heard, is investing 2.3 billion. So if I keep adding on, one can see that the interest in hydrogen is just growing. Closer home, if you look at uh, Europe, I think I'm already backdated here, but we are uh, you know, considering at least 100 gigawatt of electrolyzers to be in place. Do we have the technology? Probably not. At what price? That's what determines whether we have the technology or not. So I made some quick uh, back-of-the-envelope calculations to try and see how much electrolyzers we would need to keep our global temperature under 2 degrees. These are not my opinions. These are from different uh, opinions that I collected from the literature we see that we need to have between 100 to 270 gigawatt of electrolyzers in place within this decade. We talk about green hydrogen, but today we are mostly surviving with gray hydrogen. Green hydrogen is just a few percent of the total hydrogen that is used by industries across the globe. So what the industry has done is they have tried to go in from the uh, steam methanol reformation, trying to capture the carbon to reduce the propensity of CO2 emission, or turquoise hydrogen in which Basically, we are talking about pyrolysis. This is more or less the industry standard as of today, before the green hydrogen revolution has started, uh, started taking the imagination of all our politicians. So when we talk about green hydrogen, we are powering with solar cells, wind energy. Sweden, we are uh, very lucky. We have a lot of hydropower. And we are doing electrolysis. And your talk, Anders, was so nice introduction to what I'm going to talk about today. Just a quick recap. One kilogram of hydrogen has around 33 kilowatt hour of usable energy, while petrol and diesel is just one third of that. In ambient conditions, we are talking about roughly 30 kilowatt hour. But then, if you take any commercial electrolyzer, we are talking about 
50 to 55 kilowatt hour for one kilogram of hydrogen. In the last decade or so, we have seen rapid reduction uh, in the cost of electrolyzers. Typically, now we are talking about three to five euro per kilogram with a target from Department of Energy in the US of around 1.8 kilogra per kilogram by 2030. Anyone achieving that before is a winner. Talking about materials, if we look at how the basic you know, uh, electrolyzer technology works, if you look at the alkaline, the acidic, or the solid oxide, there was a question there. In the alkaline, electrolyzers are probably the industry standard today. PMs are more of a researcher's dream, but due to the high cost of the minerals that are required as catalysts, that becomes slightly more difficult to install industrially. Solid oxides are interesting, but the problem is you have to have iron diffusion in solid state, so that requires a very high activation energy or high temperature. So essentially, when we talk about these, catalysis is right at the center of it. In detail, if you look at how the alkaline cells work, you have a, a hydroxyl groups that are basically doing the uh, you know, conduction mechanism. In uh, PEMs, you have the hydrogen ions, and solid oxide is the oxygen ions. I made some very quick back of the envelope calculation to try and see why, instead of having a quasi 100% efficiency of electrolysis, why do we land up to 50 or 60% efficiency? Please excuse me, it's a textbook level thing. And then, essentially what I did was I tried to look at the hydrogen evolution reaction and oxygen evolution reaction and we see that the net efficiency one can get is around 0.6. And when I look at the energy efficiency of electrolysis from even more simplistic point of view, just taking the minimum chemical potential required to break water, which is 1.23 volt, divided by the electrolysis potential, I took an arbitrary number of 1.9, then we end up quite close to what I was calculating here. So what can we learn from here? The process of conversion of uh, you know, hydrogen into electrical energy is probably not effi as efficient as we would like it to be today. But is there any upsides? I think there is. In order to improve the hydrogen production, we have to find ways to reduce the resistance to this iron flow from one electrode to the other. And that's where we, were, we started thinking about, can we get rid of the membrane? Many of you know that uh, we have been working on capacitive deionization for over 20 years now in which we have two porous electrodes and by applying sorry by applying a small voltage across these electrodes we can drive the cations and the anions out of the water so you can actually purify water as jonas was mentioning by using a supercapacitor probably that's what you know uh, made me think, can we remove the membrane? I'll show you, yes, we can. 
Can we have new materials, new catalysts that can lower the overpotential? There are indications. Yes, we can. Can we think of a completely new architecture for the uh, electrolyzers? I think we can. And that's what I would like to convince you now with our uh, work, what we have done. So this is what we did. We took a bifunctional uh, catalyst, and we took a pseudo-capacitive material uh, as the anode. So essentially, you could split the water and then store the ions in the other electrode. Then you just reverse it in the next step when you're producing oxygen. So in that case, we don't need any membrane in between. It's a very simple uh, you know, construction, which was possibly motivated because I'm an old person. During my childhood, we have lived with lead-acid battery. Lead-acid battery did not have any membranes that time. And we used to see bubbles coming out. So possibly that was another motivation that we had here. So what we are doing is we are decoupling the HER, or hydrogen evolution reaction, from the oxygen evolution reaction. So what we, have we done uh, till now? We have been looking at bifunctional catalysts. Material science is the core of all this development. And we looked at, can we look at metal particles that are phosphorus-rich? Because phosphorus-rich metal particles, they have quite good HER as well as OER activity. And we took something very simple. We took a cobalt iron phosphide, and we started testing it. How does it perform? What we notice, I would like to take your attention out here, because by the way, for any alkaline electrolyzer in the market, we are talking about 300 to 500 uh, milliampere per centimeter square of current in the electrodes. So when we look at around 100 milliampere per centimeter square, the HER is around 270 uh, millivolt, while the OER was around 400 millivolt. So if we start doing the HER process and let it happen below, uh, as soon as the potential goes around 400, we switch over and go for the OER activity. So by this way, we can externally decouple the HER from the OER process. We are at the, uh, our work is at the tip of an iceberg because we have not optimized the materials at all. I just made a quick uh, search and we see that if we take nickel cobalt selenide, for example, we probably might end up getting much more efficient ca uh, catalysts. Having said that, our current efficiency is quite similar to any uh, you know, practical electrolyzer that's sold in the market for the, uh, you know, alkaline electrolyzers. So we are quite fine with that, but there has to be more upsides that can be found by simply trying to figure out new catalysts. One of the reasons why we chose this catalyst that we are using is because it is very stable. And I will show you, uh, there's a slide on chrono potentiometry which shows that it's very stable over a long time. So what we notice is that the net energy consumption, even for 100 milliampere per centimeter square, is quite acceptable. And when we try to look at in more detail, we see that the mass transport and ohmic losses, they're the major contributor to these losses. And we are working with it today as we speak to try and reduce it whichever way we can. 
this is what I was talking about, about the stability of our, uh, you know, uh, electrolyzer. So you can see that uh, galvanostatic charge and discharge at around 20 milliampere per centimeter square, it's quite constant over, I think this was about 16 hours, yes. And when we look at the cell voltage over a day, we find it very, very stable. So what have we done? We have constructed a 100 watt electrolyzer in the lab and have been testing it continuously. And then we are currently constructing a 300, uh, no, 500 watt electrolyzer, which I'll talk about it later. Interestingly, since you talked about Haber-Bosch process, we just took the same concept and tried to look, can I take the nitrates that come out from waste water plants and turn it into ammonia? So I am very lucky, I always get very good students, and that student, he showed that we can do this uh, process by using a catalyst, we are uh, considering publishing it now, that we are getting ammonia at a lower energy requirement compared to the Haber-Bosch process. So your dream could be possibly uh, possible someday. Other interesting thing about this current uh, design that we are talking about, it works both in the acidic as well as in the alkaline uh, conditions, because after all, it's about the ion uh, adsorption on the pseudo-capacitive reactor. We did not work with acidic uh, conditions, because till now we don't have a catalyst that survives acidic condition for a long time, okay? And we don't want to use platinum. Looking at the time, I will just mention about this also. All the results that I showed you as, are at room temperature, so there is an upside to get higher efficiency as we heat up the electrolyte. Industrially, by removing this uh, membrane, we are expecting between 25 to 30 percent reduction in the production cost. As well, that if you are talking about a membrane-free uh, condition, I can avoid that, we are expecting that we should get much higher dynamic, uh, much better dynamic uh, response, because since it's a supercapacitor, any changes in the electrical, uh, you know, uh, electrical current would not affect any backflow of uh, uh, hydrogen and oxygen or back mixtures, so we should have a much safer uh, arrangement. In the lab, it works, but we'll have to see it in the field. And finally, one can have Lego-like designs and install it the way you want. With this, I would like to thank you all for your kind attention. And thank you, Lena, Jonas, Ulrika, and Christoph, for giving me this platform to introduce you our new, uh, you know, technology. And thank you, Esteban, for doing all the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joy. So um, <clears throat> now we open to questions. Do we have any questions? Yes, Anders. I'm just uh, of curiosity there that if you were do it, that you have to reverse the tension, so to speak, on the system. Yes. Um, how would it work then in order to. Oh, Anders, your microphone. <laughs> so it goes out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so my question is a very interesting idea of uh, using the supercapacity. But if you were then reverse the potential, you know, to, to get the products out, what type of volume of, of production can you do? Because you have, to, you have to cycle it, I guess. On what time frame do you need to cycle it? And, and what type of volume of, of uh, generation of hydrogen can you do then in a smaller unit, so to speak? Or, uh, the type of units, uh, Anders, we are talking about is a 10 by 10 electrode. 
and uh, all of them are stacked together. So we take, uh, I think, five uh, and five, ten, ten of the stacks. So it's about a liter a minute or something? Yes, two liters a minute. So I don't think that's a problem. Follow-up question. Are you planning, is, is your most target, is that acidic or alkaline, or is it alkaline because you can't work with iridium, or iridium is too scarce, or, or what is your thought? The about? reason with uh, alkaline is it's a new, uh, completely new way of doing hydrogen. And we wanted to see the low-hanging fruit. Uh, in a sense, alkaline is much easier to handle. So we just went with that. But however, you know, uh, and this is very new. We are doing this work. We started five years back, but it started coming into place only about uh, a couple of years back. Hmm? So, but I think acidic, if we can find stable catalysts, should be very good. Do we have maybe have time for one more question? So, Joy, uh, how you. much how much money can you save by uh, skipping the membrane then? In the yes, production cost, what is the fraction of the membrane cost? Thirty percent. Thirty percent. So it's so. okay. Well, one one <laughs> last question. Yes, one comment or uh, question actually. <coughs> what is the efficiency of this process? Uh, theoretically, where would you reach? The theory, we just started to understand it now, okay? But uh, essentially, I would say at the moment, I don't want to uh, comment too much on that. We say we are at par with uh, any electrolyzers that you have. Now, in terms of Faradayic efficiency, we are nearly 98%, uh, yes. So. That is one side of that, that's basic science. But what I'm talking about is the electrolyzer itself. I think we should be able to reach around 60% with our current technology that we have, huh? up to about 400 uh, milliampere per centimeter square. But it's uh, you know science ongoing. We just started. Perfectly OK. <laughs> So maybe one last question. Then yeah, yes, a quick question, because that will be the ultimate dream goal. Could you turn it also into fuel cells so you can go electrolyzer and fuel cell? We have started toying on that idea. Uh, not only electrolyzer and fuel cell. What I was thinking about is that can we take polluted water, turn it into ammonia on one side, and take the water that is, but that is the dream. Take the water and use it for, uh, you know, uh, hydrogen production. And then can we complete the cycle? But that's a long way, Andesh. I think I'll, I'll be dead before it's done. <laughs> <laughs> thank okay. you. OK, thank you very much, Joy. And please, please, Joy, here is a, Joy, here's a book. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, so now uh, before lunch, we have one more exciting talk by Dan Harding. So please come up to, onto the stage, Dan. Uh, Dan made his PhD in Warwick in the UK, and then he moved to uh, the Fritz Haber Institute that uh, Anders had already uh, talked about, Fritz Haber. And then he moved to Göttingen, and about yeah. five years ago, Dan joined KDH. Yeah. Now, please. Have I turned my mic on? Yeah. Yes, great. Is it on? It yes, yeah. I think so. You can hear me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for the invitation to come and talk here. It's a, a distinguished place to come and speak. I'm going to tell you about the, the work that we've been doing in my group um, at, in the last five or so years at, at KTH. Um, and what we're trying to do is to do catalytic reaction kinetics in the pressure gap. So Anders... Anders Set me up beautifully, explain why this is all important. I'll um, reiterate a few things at some point. Um, I want to understand heterogeneous catalysis. I mean, um, but what I really want to understand is this last thing at the bottom. No, 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 okay. Of how the atomic structure of our catalyst 
is controlling the process. Um, real catalytic reactors are extremely complex. Um, so there's a, I mean, the catalyst, okay, kind of strange. A typical catalyst, we have these supported metal particles on some kind of oxide substrate. Um, and then uh, a catalytic reactor. But this is, this is way too complicated for me. You need to worry about multiple length and time scales. There's transport properties, so how the molecules, how the material's moving in the, in the reactor. The interactions between the support and the, and, the, and the catalyst particles itself. And then this bit that I, I want to focus on, this how the material and how the size and shape, of, I mean, the atomic size and shape of the catalyst are actually controlling the process. I'm not the first person to think this is interesting, and there's been a whole range of ways to try and understand what's going on here, using simple models of differing levels of simplicity. So one option is you try and take your active particles out away from the support and look at them in the gas phase. So then you end up with gas phase clusters. You can control the size, you can look at their properties. Um, so that's an example shown in the top, uh, top corner. You can then try and take these clusters and put them, so mass select them and put them on a surface. So, shown here. So you can then have six or seven or eight atom clusters uh, on an oxide and see how they react to try and understand this size dependence. Um, alternatively, you can try and make like large arrays of, of clusters on a surface to understand their catalytic properties. And then the Final example, and the one that I'm going to concentrate on today, is using single crystal surfaces as a model for our system. So Andrew said how I mean, if, you, if you ask the right people, they can make you these beautiful, really well-defined systems. So we have centimeter scale areas with a structure like, for example, the platinum 111 surface where you have this hexagonal arrangement of atoms. If you cut the crystal a different way, you can make square arrangements, one zero zero, and you can also get well-defined stepped surfaces. So we can explore how the structure of, this, of the surface is affecting the catalytic properties is the goal. Um, and what I hope to get from this, um, the, the field in general, we hope to really understand what's happening. We've seen some examples of this. Um, one thing is that you hope that this can help you design a catalyst. So a rational design of catalysts instead of trying carefully hundreds of different things and seeing what works. Um, and one thing that I particularly want to do, one of the big goals for me, is to actually get quantitative data that we can use to test theoretical models. There's a huge push now to use big-scale computation to predict new catalysts, so materials discovery, computational materials discovery, using machine learning in every different flavor, some kind of density functional theory. But these results, on, on the whole, are only going to be as good as the, their description of the physics that's happening. And this is what I want to do. I, I want to do experiments where we can measure quantities that can be directly calculated in theory, so that there's as few steps between the comparison as possible. And I, this is really the goal of, of, um, of my, my work. Uh, the techniques I use are really come from, gas from chemical dynamics more than surface science. Um, but what we're going to use, and, uh, and the rest of my talk, is going to be about molecular beam surface scattering. The idea here, here is that um, instead of using photoelectrons to understand what's happening in the surface, we look at what molecules are doing. Um, and this scattering dynamics will give us a fingerprint of the, of the interesting surface chemistry. So two examples. One, we start with an instant beam. I'm going to use the, try to use the pointer. We start with a beam of molecules. We shoot them at the surface. If they don't, if they don't do any interesting chemistry, they'll just bounce off like a ball against thrown at a wall. So they'll scatter off then um, close to the specular angle. And their speed will depend on the speed they were traveling before the scattering. So they have a memory of what they were doing before the collision. They just bounce. Um, another option is that they can come in, they hit the surface, they lose so much energy in this collision that they can stick. They stay on the surface for a while. So then they hang around on the surface, and sometime later they might desorb back into the gas phase. 
but they've now lost all their memory of the collision, I mean, of what they were doing before they collided. Um, they'll usually come off close to the surface normal, so directly off, and their speed will depend on the temperature of the surface. So this is just a, an example that by measuring these, these scattering distributions, we can really start to learn what, what the molecules do at the surface. Um, this was tr uh, a very I mean, slow, time-consuming experiment to do in the past because you had to move parts of your machine. You'd either move where the beam was going or move the, the detector. It was difficult. So in Göttingen, we developed, we, we bought one of the recent developed techniques from gas phase chemical dynamics and applied it to surface scattering. And this technique is called ion imaging. And it's a, a way to directly measure these lab frame scattering distributions, so these velocity distributions. The, there are three important parts to the setup. And basically, so we have our, um, our crystal sample here. We have some ion optics with which we're going to push ions around in a, a moment. And then we have a position sensitive detector at the top. And I'll show you what these do in a moment. The first step is we shoot a molecular beam through the at the surface, in this case through the ion optics. It bounces off the surface, so producing this scattering that we're interested in measuring. We then shoot a laser through, and the, the arrow's not, it actually goes directly into the board. Um, this was a poor attempt at 3D drawing. Um, the, the laser is in ionizes some of these molecules in the gas. Um, but a nice feature is that the ionization process doesn't change how fast they're moving, the direction or how fast they're moving in the lab. Um, so I've made two blobs here, the red blob and the blue blob, and these are meant to represent uh, gas molecules moving in different directions. So we then have our ions. We pulse the... We, we put a, a voltage on this... Um, this one element of the ion optics. Um, unlike jury, we use big voltages, so kilovolts. Um, and this shoots the ions up to the detector. While they're flying, they still... Oh, it's, uh, it, um, on their way to the detector, they still have this velocity component from the scattering. So the particles that were moving away from the detector here, so the blue blob, are still going to move, carry on moving away. So they'll fly to a point on the detector over here. And the particles, if we ionize the incident beam, they will carry on flying towards, in the direction towards the surface. Um, when the particles hit the detector, they make a flash of light. So the detector really converts this one ion into many electrons, and the many electrons are then slammed into a phosphor screen, and you get a flash of light, like in an old TV. Um, and you can take a picture of this light with a CCD camera. If we do this for a few laser shots, then you can very quickly build up a, an image showing this complete scattering distribution. We have the bright feature here, which is the instant beam. So these have moved. They were ionized along this line from the, the laser, the blue line, and they've moved towards the surface. And the other, uh, the other feature is this big, broad thing. And this is the scattered molecules. So this is directly showing us the scattering. Um, this was cool. We, we were very happy with this. It made the experiments that we were doing much easier. But we realized that we could do something better, more interesting. And this is that we can actually use the same technique to do time-resolved kinetics on the surface. Um, basically, we can do a pump probe experiment. Um, we use the molecular beam is the pump, which starts the process that we're interested in. And we then use the laser to probe what's happened. Um, both the, the, the molecular beam and the laser are, are, are pulsed, and we control, we control when, we fire the laser, when we fire both. And this means we can change the time between the pump and the probe. And we can measure the time dependence. Um, we tested this with some, uh, a range of systems, but I'll illustrate it here for um, the CO oxidation reaction on platinum-111. This is one of the most studied reactions in surface science, along with ammonia, basically. Um, this, so at the, at the top, there's an image of the CO2 that we produce in this reaction. We, we shoot a molecular beam of CO at a 
uh, an, uh, partially oxygen covered platinum surface, we ionize what comes off and we detect the CL. And you see this image looks a bit different. There's nothing moving towards the surface. So the laser line is the red line. There's nothing moving towards the surface because there was no CO2 in the, in in the incoming beam. But we have two blobs um, moving away from the surface. This shows we have two different types of CO2 that we've made in this reaction. Um, we can then look at how the... Um, the time dependence of these two features. So as we vary the time between the pump probe and the, the, the pump CO pulse and the laser pulse, we can see how these two things evolve in time. And this is shown here. So the, the very fast moving component is shown with the red curve and the slower moving component is shown with the blue curve. And what we found was that they actually have different time dependence. So the, the rate at which they disappear, the, the reaction slows down, is different for these two channels. Um, and what this means is that we actually have two different reaction channels on our platinum 111 surface. Um, this is, um, it took us actually a very long time to work out what was going on. We thought we have this beautiful, pristine surface. Um, what, we, the, what we came to, the conclusion we came to in the end, was that we're really seeing three different reactions. One is the reaction that we hope to see, this oxygen on this 111 terrace with CO on the 111 terrace. And this is the fast channel. This is this red or the, the very fast moving CO2. Um, but we also see two other channels. And these are reactions where the oxygen atoms are at step defect sites on our crystal. We didn't want to have them there, but even the best crystals have maybe one per mil step defect. So every thousand atoms, there's a one atom high step. Um, so we could really see these details of the reaction in these very low number sites. And with this, we could actually explain a lot of the inconsistencies in the literature about what's happening. Previously, it had been thought that there was a, an oxygen coverage dependent activation barrier. And we could show that this isn't the case. It's really just that you change between these three, which of these three reactions is dominant in the branching ratios. Um, so that was great. I mean, we, we oh, this is going to have to be quick then. Um, but we've heard there's this pressure gap between our, our experiments at UHV and um, real catalysis. So uh, what have I done now? Oh, I, yeah, I, I'll carry on talking then. So, um, I, yeah, we've seen this, this figure before from Anders, that the gas can change the surface composition. Um, and uh, Somerjai's group um, at Berkeley, they've done, shown that on a number of different surfaces, CO molecules can really change the surface, causing the formation of these well-defined clusters. Uh, so... 19 atom spheres on copper 111 or these triangles on um, did I get uh, uh, triangles on a, on a platinum surface. What I wanted to do was then to combine these, the kinetics that I, I showed you for the CO2 with working at higher pressures where we can start to drive these, surface, um, these new surfaces and closer to realistic conditions. Um, a few things we need to do this. So the, the, the detectors we use don't like high pressure, so we have to separate the, um, the detector from the scattering region, and we do this by putting uh, them in two chambers with a small aperture between them, and we're going to get the ions through this hole. Um, we need more sophisticated uh, electrodes, ion optics, to do this, so we have a, a stack of four electrodes on either side, and these guide the particles, the charged particles that we make through the detector, through the aperture, sorry, and map them at the detector. It's stuck. I'm st yes, it's stuck. I'm stuck. <laughs> yeah, okay, huh? Okay. Uh, 
I chose a PDF because I thought it'd be easy and it would just work. But <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. I'll just skip over that slide then if that's the problem. This one? Uh, yeah, th this one's great. This is where I want to be. Um, so we made sure, I and mean, we, we had to model the system, make sure this worked. Um, on the, I'm scared now to use this. So the ions are made here, the scattering, are, I mean, the scatter off here, the molecules are ionized here, and then they're guided through. They actually go through a hard focus and are then focused onto our detector. Um, we've tested this then, so having designed and built it, Yeah. Okay. Did that? Yeah. Um, we've tested it with some simple systems, so gas phase, um, photo dissociation, um, scattering N2 from palladium, where you only get single bounce collisions. And what we see is that at, um, at ultra high vacuum or near ambient pressure, so 10 to the minus 3 millibar of Argon, we basically don't see any difference in the scattering di in the um, in the distributions that we measure. So this is shown on the on the far side. Okay, would you? Okay, maybe do do it on the small, and I'll click through it. It's easier. Okay. That's yeah. That's stuck. Okay, um, so yeah, we've tested this then. We want to do kinetics, so we've done two simple systems. The, the first one is to look at CO desorption from palladium 1.0. One, one so here we, we're really measuring the binding energy of the CO on the surface. Um, we shoot the CO and we look at the CO coming back as we change the time. The, okay, this is skipped to... Okay, Th so we get the, the, the image of the scattering CO, we look at the signal in this region, and then we can do this for different temperatures. So can you click through a bit quick? And what you see is that this, this transient is changing as we change the surface temperature. So, and another, another stop, yeah. yeah. And again, this was a pseudo animation. You see that the, the, um, the peak is becoming sh higher and shorter. And this is really showing that we're measuring the CO desorption kinetics. We measure the, we can fit this, we can model the kinetics and fit it, and we get rate coefficients as a function of surface temperature. We can do Arrhenius and measure the binding energy. So this is good. And the final thing I quickly show you, um, I'm happy to ask, answer questions about this later, of course. Um, can you, yeah. Is to look at reactive kinetics. So here, um, we are doing CO oxidation on palladium 110. It's again quite well studied. The nice feature for us here is that um, the group in Lund have mapped out the surface phase diagram for us. So, as a function of oxygen, partial, of oxygen pressure and temperature, they, know, they can tell us what surfaces we have. And what, what, um, there's a big question here. It, within the literature, really, about whether these oxidized surfaces are actually active for CO oxidation. It's not really clear. Um, and we're going to look, I'm, the, the data I'm going to show you is just this small uh, temperature and pressure region in, covered by the red bar. And going from the lowest pressure, there's the C2 by 1 structure, which is a common uh, structure for adsorbed oxygen atoms, and at higher pressure it drives a reconstruction to form this actually mix, but in, uh, you see there's many more oxygen atoms basically on the surface at the higher pressure. Okay, can you take a step for me? Um, the kinetics are more complex, I uh, don't have time to go into that, but basically what we can do is we can shoot, again we have a well-defined pressure of O2, um, we use our CO beam as a pump to start the reaction, and then we look for the CO2 that we're making. And this is shown, so these, um, these plots now show the CO2 we're producing as a function of the oxygen pressure. So this is at 2.5 times 10 to the minus 8 millibar, a pretty low pressure. Could you take a step? 
here we go up to 5 times 10 to the minus 8 millibar, and you see there's a huge increase in the CO2 production. If we take another step to 7.5, then it's not that different. If anything, it's, it's going slightly faster, but it's not so different. And we go up again, another 2 to 1. Ta, ta, oh, no, that's, sorry, there's way too many slides now. Um, Still. Yeah. Uh, uh, no. Go forwards to, uh, or let me, maybe let me, let me. I, it's, it's easier, isn't it? Okay, so we, well, when we get to, to 1 times 10 to the minus 7, you see that the CO, the CO2 production is actually starting to go down. Another step to 5 times 10 to the minus 7, we've almost turned the reaction off. So this, we interpret this as that these oxide surfaces are really not reactive. Um, Okay, so yeah, the question then, are these reactive? The, the low coverage oxide is reactive, the high coverage one is not. We need, this is work in progress, so we still have quite some stuff to do to fully explain what's happening here. Um, so I've shown you a, yeah, a new instrument and told you a bit about the new possibilities. Um, we can do kinetics in the pressure gap. It's nice because it's a tabletop experiment. We don't need a synchrotron to do this, which is uh, an advantage, I think. Um, there's lots of stuff to do to increase the pressure. Um, and the most important, I need to thank Stephen, who is here today, and Leah, who isn't, who did all the work, and SSF, who paid for a lot of it. Thank you. And you for your attention. Thank you, Liam. Um, uh, sorry, I've overrun. <laughs> <laughs> Some uh, technical problems here. <laughs> Uh, so very exci exciting talk. So uh, I think uh, maybe we have time for one question or so be because we're now heading yeah. into the lunch <laughs> break. So uh, Anders, you have a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very nice. I, I assume that that you see two different rates there for that for the sea oxidation in the beginning of your talk. Is that because the oxygen is more bound at the step edge? Uh, so it's more more harder to get off. But just a comment, when, when you're then going into the higher pressure where you start yep. also to generate oxide, you know, the, the surface can be become very complicated. Yes. But because you can have ongoing oxidation and reduction at the same time, because yes. the CU is a reduction medium here. So, so you can have a lot of restructuring on the surface. So it's probably going to be essential for you to combine your kinetic measurements yes. uh, and you have to go to the synchrotron again. Probably, <laughs> yes. So uh, To combine this, all these different techniques because, yeah. for instance, we made a recent study with also the Lund group uh, in, the, in this Polaris instrument that but actually during the oxide-rich conditions the, the, the you have actually metallic particle uh, sitting on top of the oxide, so okay. and and that can generate a lot of different sites yeah. and, and, and and so on. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is yes, it, I agree. Um, I forgot to mention it. You you can see it in the photo of the instrument. We actually have um, a reactor STM which is attached to the instrument. So this is a STM system that can go from UHV up to four bar pressure if we want within a few minutes. So this is something that. I've worried about um, that we really need to know what the structures are, so we hopefully we can actually characterize the oxides that we're making in the reaction. So I, I don't maybe didn't make it clear, but we continually redose the oxygen. So the goal is to achieve some kind of steady state, some kind of stable mm -hmm. uh, surface. But so what is the highest local pressure you can go to? At the moment, we can go to 10 to the minus 3 millibar. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, with relatively straightforward to probably get another two or three orders of magnitude pressure, mm -hmm. we need more pump and an extra. I, if there's some similarity, so this crossing mm. iron trajectories are a bit like the APXPS, mm. where you can go through multiple sure. crosses, and I think we could do that mm. also with our irons and still have the, the mapping. Mm. So that's, yeah, probably another factor mm. of a thousand. Very good. Uh, thank you, Dan. And uh, you. now uh, we'll close this session and we will then reconvene. Was it 12.30? Yes. So, yeah, thank you very much. And Dan, please, here, have a copy of this one. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back.
it's great to have you back. I know that sunshine was sort of a <laughs> dragging us away from here, but it's great to have you back. Um, we're in for a treat, because now we're really going to have some exciting discussions regarding high voltage technologies. So what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? What are the bottlenecks? And how do we position this technology in a circular economy? So there will be a lot of interesting discussions. There will be ample of time to answer or ask questions. And I would, again, encourage people that are watching remotely to also ask questions. Please use the chat. We will moderate the questions as they come in. Uh, so what we will have here is a very knowledgeable panel of experts that will help me discuss and really dive deep into this area. Uh, we will ask uh, our panelists to first uh, give a few comments, their take on the subject, so to speak. And after that, we will have a group discussion. And please, ask as many questions as you wish. OK, so here to discuss these topics with me, uh, I have Professor Lina battling Shanbei, uh, Professor in Power Grid Technology at KTH, also Director of the Energy Platform at KTH, and a member of EVA Division too. Please, Lina. It's also a pleasure to introduce Mikael Dahlgren, Head of Corporate Research at ABB in Sweden, long-time uh, expert in high-voltage technologies. Great to have you with us. Uh, Mikael is also a member of EVA Division II. Uh, we have Bo Nordmark, so uh, happy to welcome you to the stage. Industrial Strategic Executive at EIT Energy and also at KTH, and since recently also honorary doctor at KTH. Uh, Bo is likewise a member of EVA Division II. And Mikael Unge at NKT High Voltage Cables in Westeros. Great to have you here. And also a colleague of mine because you're a young professor at the Department of Fiber and Polymer Technology at KTH. Yeah. So, heartfelt welcome to all four of you. And we would like to start now by hearing just short inputs from all of you. Where are you on the high voltage map, so to speak? So, Lina, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, introduction, Enrique. So, I'm happy to hear, be here in my other hat. So, now I'm a professor in power grid technology. Um, obviously, we will not be able to give a long speech here. So, if you have any question afterwards, you're welcome to contact me. Uh, you have my email here. Can everyone hear? Yes? Good. Um, when I was finishing up my presentation, I realized I didn't have any picture of grid at all because we were trying to shorten it down, shorten it down, and at the end I said, oh my god, I need to put in something. So I put in this picture, and um, I'm not sure about you, but when I'm traveling, I always get this uh, magazine. I think this is one of the most brilliant magazines. And this time, it was an, uh, a picture that was just amazingly beautiful, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> so um, the main message here is really that all of us need to like power grids. Some of us have done that for quite many years, uh, but not so many people have seen them or, or been thinking about how things work. But now uh, the main message here is really that we need these stuff. They're really needed in the society. So, and why do we need them? Well, we work on the energy transition, obviously. That is pushing a lot of pressure on the energy supply. So this is the infrastructure, really, to make that happen. But we have another aspect here, too, and that is the security aspect. Uh, some of you maybe have seen this picture, and if you have not, uh, it's a very beautiful uh, picture trying to uh, symbolize what happened approximately a year ago when the, um, the joint um, grid in, in European Union uh, were connected with Ukraine Moldavian. So this is a technical uh, way to actually support also in security level. But today, we're not focusing on the grid, uh, but today we're focusing on the high voltage technology that make this work. So it is a little bit coming from the top. So instead of what we had before lunch, you are exploring the electrons and see what, what happens. We are a little bit coming from the other side and see how can we secure the system? How can we make this work in a sustainable, good way? So what I will do today in the, my short talk is to tell you a little bit about the report that will be published 
in June uh, this year at a conference. And this is a joint effort uh, with a lot, around 13, 16 people from different countries. And we have worked on a project called Lifetime Extension of high voltage equipment. So this is what I will briefly um, comment on you. And the motivation we see here is that we have this huge requirement for expansion, but we also have a lot of aging facilities and we have a little bit of hurry. And we also have to think about the circular economy that I know um, other will comment on more. So very briefly, uh, this uh, project was starting um, during the COVID time, actually. So the first time we met physically was last year. And then we had a technical uh, visit, and then we were finishing up the report uh, today. And as you see here, this is a typical way we work. So it's a lot of experts, and the experts are mixture from industry, academia, from the DSO, TSO, or from manufacturers. So this is a way to capture uh, knowledge in this way. And this is an overall uh, vision or description of what we are presenting. So we are looking at different experiences of lifetime exp options. We are going through maintenance, which is basically a tool trying to impact on the equipment. And then we are looking at different new ideas of how we can modernize, retrofit the equipment, and how we can work on economic profitability. And at the end, the purpose of it, of the circular economic. Um, so um, end of life can be defined in a different way. We can have the technical um, end, and the whole idea here is really that we will impact on this end of life in order to look at the circular and the sustainable solution for it. Um, and this figure here is trying to compile a different tools of order to do this. And I captured it in the, the word of maintenance. And this is where we do our research. So in reality, um, where I work, we have worked around 20, 30 years on taking out smart uh, models here in order to predict failures, in order to uh, modeling aging in the equipment. So it's obviously a material question, but we're working on equipment in the power system. So we have worked on systematic models where we do the modeling on the equipment level, and then we're trying to uh, connect it back to the system level. And I think this is kind of interesting on how you also work on your different theories. Uh, and here, I will obviously not go through this, but I'm just putting in so you can get a feeling of the different examples we have looked at. And one of the ideas with this study is that we see that uh, traditionally, we have had the most advanced models and tools and equipment on the high voltage, on the transmission level. But what we see now with the changes in the grid is that we get a more complex system. So now we need to in integrate a lot of new technology and new, more advanced tools on the distribution level. So this is why we, in our working group, have not focused at all on different voltage levels. We are just collecting uh, best practice on all voltage levels. So we are, what we think, or what I think, is that we in future will use more advanced models on distribution level. And this is one uh, example where we're looking at the impact of digitalization in uh, substation. And this is an area where I actually did my own PhD thesis many times back, and it's on different way of uh, preventing failures in cables. And we have an expert in cables here that will, will comment back to that. And here is another study that's looking on uh, the influence of having a storage uh, with the equipment and in ha how that will impact. So that was my uh, starting presentation, and then I will be happy to continue with discussion later on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lena. <laughs> Thank you for providing food for thought so long. So you sort of already handed over a little bit to Mikkel, yes, because now <laughs> we're expecting more on the circular <laughs> economy <laughs> aspect. <laughs> so please. Thanks. Let's see. Uh, first of all, thanks for being invited. It's, uh, uh, I think it's really a thrill to be here. Uh, first of all, ABB is not really a high voltage company. We work up to 72 kV right now. We sold up out the high voltage business to Itachi and the cable business to NKT. So my old two colleagues here. So I will ask you some tricky question later since I have roughly 20 years of experience. But ABB, by the way, I was focusing on sustainability. For some years ago, we put a target of having 8% of our product should have a circularity approach. And we have been addressing that quite heavily. And we have actually B 
build this model how we actually do our whole target to get there. And you can see that we are looking on the, uh, let's see, uh, the responsible end of life. How do you do the recycling? How do you take care, take back the thing? Which I think is also important for the grid because you will have the same problem in here. And then the most important thing is actually when you start to design. And I will come back to that, why that is critical for the whole circular approach, because there, there it starts that you have it. And the sourcing of material, that we really get material that are sustainable and have as little CO2 footprint as possible. And then we need to work in our own processes and we need to optimize the use phase, the efficiency. We see a lot of development pushing down the efficiency and then the lifetime. And I will give you some example of what we have done in the last year. Actually, up here you see that we start to use recycled materials in electrical applications. And this needs to be material that can withstand the dielectrical uh, stress on them. And that's why you cannot just take any material. And I think that's what they normally start on fairly low voltage and then it starts to go up to higher and higher voltage that we can do it. Um, the next example is what we have done, where I go with a little bit more in deep in this one on the motors actually, how we do take back and recycling of them. But I will go that as a perfect example how you actually involve digitalization into this one. And then I think here we have done for quite a long time the robots where we take them back and we remanufacturing them and sell them as new again. And this we have done for 10 years because it makes sense from a business perspective. It's very easy to do it. And there we have good relationship with the customer so we can easily do that. And this I also think is something we should think in the transmission grid of doing this kind of things. And the last but not the least efficiency. Uh, 45% of all the electricity in the world is used in a motor. And mostly people buy a motor based on cost, not on the cost of the electricity to drive it. So making that a change, buying a motor with 92% or 89% efficiency compared to buying one with 95%. Huge amount of money and environment, which is quite interesting how you need to get that turn around. But if you see in principle how you need to work with it from a material manufacturing research is that you need to start with an LCA of product and services. And this is a tricky by itself because I think it's, I read some time ago that there are 13 different standards how to do LCA. And if you choose one, it can be perfect. If you choose another one, it's going to be a disaster. So it's all how you interpret it and use the right one. So you really use it in a smart way. And then what we have done in ABB is to see what kind of circular strategy should you have. Should make a product that you actually recycle, you turn it down, or should you refurbishment, or should you do a lifetime extension of the product. It depends on product and type of product that is important. And then we do a lot of things exploring that further. And this kind of thing is all driven by digitalization and data-driven part in it. I give you one example of uh, embedded circularity in the products. And I take the motor actually from ABB because there where we have come the farthest way in getting to this 80% circularity. What you need to do is that we have put the sensor on the equipment and then we start to it generate data, identify it, we see what we do with the uh, delivering that kind of thing with the smart motor to the customer. And then when we take it back, we have a discount on the motor take back volume. So if we can get back them and then we can send a new motor that is more efficient, that is actually pro profitable for them to do it. And then we have a service agreement. All of this demands actually digitalization traceable. That's why we need the sensor from the beginning. That's why it sometimes makes sense just to add a sensor on, and then when the customer want to do it, it makes smart things to do. So what we need is the data, we need the LCA, early fleet report, 
we need to have old motor recycle. Here we've done that with SCA and Stena Recycling. So we have done this and testing it out. And my last slide as a sort of a summary. When you work on material, because this is partly material energy, so I like to put them together. The material is important, but the manufacturing and the design is as important when you decide. So you need to have a design, and the design is the most important thing what you do. If you don't do the design right, you will not have a circular approach later. So I stopped there. So I got a little bit how we in ABB are working on this topic. So Thank you, Michael. Very interesting. Um, Bo, would you like to continue? Thank you. <coughs> First of all, it's good to be back at EVA. And I will take a completely different approach, actually, and try to explain uh, why, uh, what you, uh, how you innovate, and also how innovation is made and what is important. I will take you back to 1988. Uh, some of you may, were not even born, maybe. And, but at that time, uh, I will wait with this picture, by the way. Take it back. Uh, because I'll take the history first. Uh, 1988, uh, a company was called, for, uh, called ABB. It was a merger between ASEA and Brown Boveri, uh, two major electric companies that had about 90% overlap in product portfolio. And uh, of course, people said this is a very happy marriage because now we can take the best of, of both of all worlds, uh, combining the best technologies from the, from the two companies. And that, of course, started a fantastic fight among engineers. What was the best technology? And there were some views on this, I can tell you. So after a few years, in 1992, the, after four years, the company executive found out that innovation has basically stopped in the company because it was infighting rather than developing new things. And they were started mapping how much of the new sales was actually new products. And that was continuously going down. So they launched a program which was called a hip, high impact, they said, okay, anyone that has a bold idea, and it should be bold, uh, but could potentially have a major impact, will get money, and a lot of money. And particularly, we encourage people to work cross-border, cross business lines and cross national borders. And that, at that time, this guy, Gunnar Asprin, R&D guy, uh, working for me, he presented this map. He said, well, this is my vision. Uh, I would like to see a renewable, uh, basically renewable system, energy system of all of Europe, based on wind, solar, and hydro. And um, for that, we will need transmission. That was his theme. And that was said in a time when many people said, well, you know, with renewables, you need less transmission because it's distributed and local. No, no, said we, it's not distributed and local. It will be big, uh, big parks. You see also all the green dots are out in the, out in the North Sea. Uh, that is uh, why some people are happy now, getting con big contracts. So, uh, but from taking this vision, how could we do, do it better than, than anyone else? Well, the idea was we talked to the cable guys. I was responsible for making the converters from AC to DC. And asked the cable guys, what constitutes the breakdown of, of, a, of a DC cable? At that time, cables were made of, of lapped paper. And um, they told us that one condition that if you have a sudden temperature change, uh, the voltage will stand will go down in the cable, potentially because there can be voids in the cable. So no problem, we fix it, because then we can uh, bring down the voltage on the cable. So that's how it all started. And then uh, the cable guys, uh, you will hear more about, they have started making extruded cables. So you have plastic installation instead of, of, of um, uh, paper. So they told us that what breaks down uh, this uh, extruded cable, what really kills the cable, is actually a plus minus uh, polarity reversal of the cable. That kills the cable. And all DC converters are, are, uh, can potentially have this power uh, polarity reversal. But then we said, OK, there is a new technology, not still on the market uh, in, in big scale, especially not for high voltage, where you will never have a polarity reversal. How about that? What, how, what kind of cable can you make if you can guarantee no polarity reversal. And that was the base for building a system. And that's my theme here. You, we were building a system uh, that was optimized. So the converters and cables together uh, could have the, um, the best possible performance. And that uh, technology was done. We even had a patent, which is fantastic. We had a patent how with the HVDC converter plus extruded cable. 
Uh, unfortunately for ABV, he touched that panel that is not valid anymore. That patent was incredible patent. So uh, T means that if you want to really innovate, uh, you have to go beyond the borders of your own product. And I will finish up with giving an example of a recent example, because today I work not so much with high voltage, but with batteries. Why do you think the charging curves uh, looks like this on the cars? Very strange, isn't it? It's all about survival of the battery and extend the life of the battery. Because the guys have learned now, if you want to make a good electric car, you must understand batteries. And if you want to must make good batteries, you must understand materials. So they are basically optimizing uh, how, you, how you charge. One point in time, people said, if you fast charge a car, the battery will die. Not at all. Because they know how to do it. And the, it's, the charging curve is different every time you charge, by the way. And the result is that a modern electric car, degradation of the battery uh, after 200,000 uh, miles is 10% in average. 200,000 miles. It's all about how you make sure that you can control the weaknesses in the materials and in the batteries. That was my speech for today. Next. <laughs> Thank you, Bo. <laughs> and Mikael, several people have now said that we will hear from the cable expert, yeah, okay. uh, meaning Thank you. So now we're <laughs> super excited about what you have to say. Uh, yeah, thanks. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, come and present uh, some of this uh, uh, work that I've been involved in, and, and ABB before, and now at NKT, and partly at KTH. Uh, so I will talk about, let's see how this works. Yes. We we'll come back to Gunnar Asplund. <laughs> now, but uh, high voltage cables, how they, how they are involved in, in the green energy transition. As, and um, what you say, we at NKT, that we connect the greener world with basically because it's a very key component if you want to have the offshore wind farms, for instance, if they are on the deep sea, then, then they are floating and you need dynamic cables. You should be able to take the load from you know, the wind farms moving 70 meters in different directions in a stormy day. Um, and we can also use the same dynamic cables for oil and gas platforms and uh, bring power from the shore to th this platform to significantly reduce their CO2 emissions. And you can see some figures here from, uh, from uh, installations on the outside Norway. If we go back to the HVDC cables, and uh, I made a new map <laughs> from Gunnar, but um, where we were in US some time also to include that. But typically you need a high voltage level to, in order to transmit uh, your power on a long distance. So if you want to go further, uh, you increase your voltage and you keep the transmission losses uh, down to a reasonable level. And that, of course, comes into the material properties. But I think we have, and both uh, before with Gunnar Asplund and the teams, but also later we in the ABB time uh, for the sites in Sweden, we were first or reaching the no standard 525 kilovolts, and we also qualified up to 640. So quite good uh, or historically and also present in, in this area in Sweden. Yes, and uh, there are some, some installations here. And, and uh, this, let's see, which is the pointer. Yeah, here's typically all the green farms that should be connected uh, to the German markets, where since they're now closing down their nuclear power plant, they need to transmit a lot of power from, from the wind farms. And uh, about long connections, there is actually a, a competitor to us, but they build a new company just to build this little cable here from UK to Morocco to have large solar cell parks and, and get this, this energy up to Europe. So quite, quite interesting project. If you want to prepare or produce a, a cable. Uh, nowadays, primarily, it's uh, the extruded polyethylene cables that are the dominated in the market. Um, and there are a lot of interest. And actually, our new tower is not the recent, uh, least, uh, most recent one. But uh, last Friday, actually, it was announced that we will make a third tower in Cascuna um, to be able to produce these cables. Because you want to keep a your insulation round, and then it's preferably to have the cable hanging down in a very high tower. So the this next tower will be 200 meters, which means the next highest building in Sweden. 
And uh, the performance comes down to the material, essentially, uh, and the material system in, in the material, but in the cable, because there are several different materials. But what we want to do is avoid the thermal runway, which would lead to electrical breakdown. And primarily what you want to do is to keep the connectivity at a very low level. As you know, you said once, there are, there are no insulators. Uh, they're just poor conductors. Um, and that what is what we want to achieve. So I, actually, so I will step down to the material. This is my background, actually. So the material that we have is then cross-linked polyethylene. So it's a very basic fundamental chemical. Uh, cross-linked means that we use some chemical reactions to uh, connect the polymer chains to get them uh, better mechanical properties. But byproducts from this process are impacting the connectivity at this low level which are we are needed to have. So even though we have thousand kilometers cable, we need to control the material down to molecular level. So that of course brings a lot of uh, R&D topics, challenging topics to, to consider. And we do both experimental work, of course, and simulations to connect this and to really understand all the processes that are ongoing. And actually, we do go down to atomic scale and simulate how the current would flow in the in material to really understand what's the properties. If you look a little bit ahead, what, what's our next and what is driving, what, why we are needing even better materials than we have today, yeah, we want maybe to go even longer distances with higher voltages as a consequence, and we want to transmit more power per cable, so we need to allow higher temperatures in the cable. And potentially, if we have a lot of wind, uh, there could be a peak production, and can we handle this overload capability with the existing uh, cables then? And typically, there are three areas of development of the materials. Either you add nanoparticles in the, in the polymer matrix, or molecular additives. Both of them can significantly reduce the connectivity and to some extent improve electrical breakdown strengths. A third area which starts to evolve is also controlled morphology. We can see that the morphology is influencing also the connectivity down with order of magnitudes as well. And so definitely it's challenging production techniques, uh, uh, properties here to keep in control. In literature, nanoparticles primarily is oxide, metal oxide, silicon carbide, and so on. But can we do that in another way with more abundant materials? There's a lot of materials that are needed. Um, and we have at the KTH, where some are, I'm also located, we're exploring a bit carbon based structures. And you could even take, produce your biochar, uh, basically burned waste, and pr pick out the nanoparticles that you can find there. Um, and of course, we can work with alternative sources polyolefins, which we need for the base matrix. And yeah, the recycling part, we should of course continue. And uh, on the digitalization part, uh, as Selina were in on this monitoring and the lifetime, it's a very important. And, and then also combine that with predictive models. So that this is a little bit uh, on putting some questions perhaps and for the discussions. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you to all of you for giving good perspectives on high voltage technology and you know its position in, in the energy transition so i'm sure there are tons of questions but still i would like to start here because i have a question that i would like each and every one of you to address a little bit like what would you see as the largest bottleneck to make high voltage technology fly even better in the energy transition you can pick one <laughs> lena <laughs> Well, I think, um, I mean, one of the challenges here is that we are in a hurry. Uh, so it's a lot of things happening. I was sitting at the seminar uh, last week at the uh, standardization group. And then they were very, uh, it was from the military side, where they were very, had strong challenges, because in the solar um, development now, making a lot of noise. Um, so the military has a trouble. And here, the standardization has not been... Uh, detailed enough on that technology. So we're starting now, I think, to see a little bit impact on it has been a very fast transition. And from our side, we had this um, incident in Stockholm a week ago or two weeks. And now they're trying to analyze what happened. It was a substation outside Stockholm. It was a planned maintenance. And I was trying to say, this is OK. We plan maintenance. And it's a probability it will not work, I mean, because that's how, how it is. 
uh, but now they're starting to investigate, and what you normally see is that these technical systems are very complex, and they're getting even more complex. <laughs> and we have in included a lot of uh, digital tools, and we have, because here it was, the first um, event was a mistake, handling mistake by maintenance personnel, and then um, they were connecting. Uh, so Forsmark 1 and 2 was disconnected, and that was not the plan. <coughs> so something happened here, and that was the protection system that didn't work as planned. So I think a lot of these things, um, we need to, it's a lot of things we don't really know. Mm. So I think uh, we need to do a lot of research, actually. And, and other is also on what I said in the beginning, that we have a lot of knowledge on transmission level, but distribution level has been very simple in the past. So uh, what I believe is that we will move down a lot of these technologies down, but the um, tradition is not there. So they haven't done that in the past. So this will be a cost. So then someone has to invest in that. Mm. Uh, so I think we, uh, well, I don't think reliability will be better <laughs> coming. We, we will have a little bit of challenge. Uh, but it's a lot of exciting things. I mean, we can do a lot of things, but, but we need to do it also. So mm -hmm. that is a little bit... And we have to understand the vulnerability yeah. or the soft spots, yeah, basically, yeah. that's what you're yeah. saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. So we need also technology to support the technology in that yes. sense. Yes. Mm. And someone has to pay for it, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> As always. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Lina. Mikael, what would you say? It's what a very good question. I think we are in the second revolution of electrification at the moment. We had the one for 100 years ago. Now we see that we replace a lot of all uh, fossil fuel by electricity mainly for heating process. Uh, there we need actually to increase the electricity production. And this is really something. Um, the technology is there. I believe that there are companies able to build it. For sure we need to further develop the technology, that's no question. But the base technology is already there. It's just to implement it. But what is hindering is the regulation and the permits to build. And this is actually stopping the whole uh, transition. Mm. So I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we have. <coughs> mm. yeah. So you need to find someone that actually wants to expand and you want it I, in I, my I backyard and not in someone yeah. else's backyard. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's something that you see on an everyday basis, that it's sort of stopping yeah. the process. Yeah. yeah. So we have vulnerabilities in the system. We have sort of a resistance towards mm. the expansion that we all need, want to benefit from, basically. Mm. Yeah. Bo. Uh, I, I would rise to the, take a different angle on this, because the first electric revolution, why it happened so fast? Because people worked in collaboration. Collaboration between industry, government and research. We need to re-establish that and we need to sort of say, if, because uh, if we want to build things fast, if we want to implement new technologies fast, there must be risk sharing and there must be a different kind of cooperation. I think that is actually what is going on now in the North Sea, mm -hmm. uh, where the, the customer, so to say, works together with, with the suppliers so they can share the risk and they can take a step. I think we need to more, see more of that. And that's why I show this uh, example of what I've seen so much in the, in the electric car and the battery industry. I mean, name of the game is people are building uh, strategic value chains uh, that they can take bolder and quicker steps. Hmm. And on which, lev which level do you think that that type of collaboration or co-sharing needs to be settled? Is it the local community that does it, or is it all on the European no, level? B bigger than that, it, it has to go all the way, because you know, since I've, I've seen quite a lot of that, it has to go all the way from at least it's a European level, national level, and down to industry. And uh, because that, that, and again, it's about risk sharing. Uh, otherwise, things will not happen because you, you will not take the risk. Mm. Or you cannot see that it's worth the investment, it's, it's, it's I guess. It's too high risk. Mm. And, uh, it's also, and one, th think, one way to, to uh, reduce the risk, that is that you have uh, ambitious but realistic plans so people know what's going to happen uh, reasonably well because then you, you, can, you can spend money on, on investing in factories and investing in R&D. And so I think it's... A little back to, to uh, what we did in the past, but in a different way. Hmm. Mm. Mikael, your take yes. on the bottleneck question. Yeah, I was thinking, I mean, in same way, as Mikael said, that uh, when the technology is there and we, and we can just implement it, but we need to manufacture it as well. Uh, so we will start our new, build our new tower. And that was basically because it came in large orders from 
from Tennet in, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, so, I mean, it's also a time question to, to uh, build up the system with, with, with uh, and producing cables and potentially other components as well, of course. Uh, mm. I guess that's one bottleneck. Mm. So it's because on the many, component level. Many then. others are already buying their cables and components and substations to, to get their wind, wind farms in, in place and so on. Mm. So I'm sure that there are also many questions that you have. I'm not, I'm not going to steal the entire show here. So please, who wants to ask the first question? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Mika Roos. Lina gave a very good description of what happened the uh, 26th of April. But I'm thinking of what else can happen in Europe because we have the grid is very old in many countries and we have lack of spare parts and the delivery time of new equipment for the grid is very long. So this might cause a lot of problem. Can you t tell us a little more about that? Mm -hmm. I can, um, I can Please give a comment on that. Um, well, obviously it has to be some specific answers to specific questions. But in general, on, on the high voltage level, you, you would have a priority order. So you would have, um, and that's why we have a very long uh, tradition of collaborating between the, the different countries, because it helps us if something happens. So on transfer high voltage transformer level, for example, you can shift. You can shift a transformer if you have a critical. And here we have a system within the Nordic system, for example, where you can move to critical basis. And we also have developed during the year some transformers you can actually ship, um, ship on a um, truck. It's because the transformers would be one thing that it takes quite a long time to build it. So these kind of emergency things, they, they exist, but it's mostly on the high level. So on the lower level, it's a new challenges. And that's why some of us are very happy for the new development with local generation from solar, for example, because it gives us a redundancy. So if something happens, it gives a robustness to the system. So I think the combination is very important that we work both. Uh, the picture I showed here was um, on European level, but it's ENSOE. So ENSOE is an organization with all the TSOs in, European, in Europe, and they have a plan, like a long-term plan. Um, and in those, um, we have an agreement, et cetera, to help. But that is on the transmission level. So on the more local level, I think what we're doing now is a very good thing. Uh, but we will probably have a lot of challenges in front of us, I think. Even though technology exists, uh, it's still difficult to have it running in operation. And, and I think, actually, if I would say another answer to the first question is that I think one of the major problems now is actually, that maybe Bo was mentioning, is the, uh, what's happening in the European Union now, because it's regulate, I mean, they're regulating. So we basically don't have a market anymore. I mean, some of us say we don't even have a market. Uh, because they're regulating it. So that is, is a, a problem, major problem, I think. Yeah, mm. yeah that's interesting. I mean, several yeah. of you <coughs> mentioned this thing with legislation, but how can we then feed in? I mean, can we in any way feed back to legislative processes before they're a fact, so that we can sort of steer the process a little bit? What opportunities do we have? We have several opportunities, but we don't use them. Mm -hmm. Sweden is very poor in, in being active in Brussels. I spend mm -hmm. a lot of time there. We are never active, especially in the energy field. We are on uh, all, all uh, we will not mention different type of seminars, not energy. So there is all, a lot of opportunities to do it, but we have to learn also that things are moving fast. We cannot sit on our hands because uh, the time that you have that you, where you can interview is short and you have to be there. So, and then we cannot complain because uh, we have the chance as other people have also. And, but I will also say that I, I, maybe my opinion is that you need to regulate. Otherwise, we will not get anywhere because uh, competition is there. And if you look at the big competition out from, from Asia or even from the US, I mean, a lot of that is driven by regulation uh, and very, very extensive regulation. Uh, so, uh, to, to some, we, People talk about smart regulation. I think that's a good, good uh, I mean, way to expressing it. So regulation is not necessarily bad. No. It's driving things. Can. Yeah. 
Mm. Can I give you just a comment? I, I was actually in Brazil uh, um, last week, I think, or mm. the week before, and it was the first time I was there not as an expert, mm. but as a more uh, industry or you know, policy person. And what, what I, I learned uh, quite a lot, but it's, it's quite scary to know that we have 21 people there representing us, and some of them are not even, you know, they don't even want to be there. So I think it is, it is a quite scary to, to feel that there are so many opportunities that we could work harder on. Mm -hmm. uh, because, for example, I, I met, um, we were visiting, uh, for example, at Svensk Energi, uh, and then they were having people from Norway there. And obviously, they know they're not part, but they were more active than we were. So we were kind of shocked, you know, but you're not part. Well, we, we know people in the commission <laughs> and so on. So, mm -hmm. and, and everyone from Norway that are there, they want to be active. Mm. But from us, how, I mean, some of our people there don't even want to contribute. But I, but I also got a very big respect of a lot of people working very hard for us. And I actually have this little um, pen today also. <laughs> uh, because now, as you know now, Sweden is um, leading uh, European Union. And uh, Sweden has um, selected to put energy market on the high priority. So the government are putting a lot of effort in this. So I think we should really uh, make effort to that. Uh, but it is a challenge, and I, I totally agree. The regulation is very good, but it has to be done carefully. Mm -hmm. And now I think it's kind of destroying the market on electricity at the moment. But, but regulation is really important, and standardization, of course. Mm. Uh, but it's good if all of us are contributing to be more active, I think, because it would be very good for everyone. Yeah. Mm. Homework for all of you, yeah? <laughs> No, but from a material perspective, me being a material scientist, I can really see how new legislation also push forward mm. a business where you thought that, oh, it would be too difficult, you know, and then there's a new directive and, you know, you have to make it work simply mm. because now it's a fact. Mm. So it can be also a, a sort of pushing in the right direction kind of activity, mm. of course. But yeah, we have to make sure that we, we use it to our best interests, of course. Mm. So lots of answers to your question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Do we have anything from our digital participants on the chat? Uh, no, unfortunately, uh, nobody has asked anything. <laughs> <laughs> you have like another question. Mm -hmm. I think a follow up on that. I think we are looking at a very big challenge, and we know how to handle that, or we think we know when the weather is beautiful and fine, and mm -hmm. then we start having a completely different situation in the world where maybe this critical material are not coming, mm -hmm. uh, how does industrial capitalism can handle that, or can it at all? Mm. I perhaps can take that. I think you always look for second supplier and second options. Mm. You are very rarely relying on one source. Mm. I think the, when the world was coming in Ukraine, it took us as a company a couple of months to reshuffle the older thing and was not that dependent. And I think all of the companies have that, and you always have a sort of a plan. I think the biggest challenge at the moment is if we get a disconnect of China, because there we have a lot of reliance to get material and components. So I think that's the biggest challenge mm. for Europe, actually, how to cope if that is happening. And that's a little bit outside our control also. But there, I mean, on the China issue, uh, we should welcome China because they are building factories here. Yeah. I mean, the last one you heard in Timro, they have... How many of you have heard about a company called Senior Materials AB? Hands up. Anyone Zero have? hands. Uh, thank you for that. Because uh, <laughs> you're, in, you're, in, you're in good company. That's, that's a Chinese company, second in the biggest in the world making separator field for batteries. Mm -hmm. Second biggest in the world. They are, as we speak, building a factory in uh, Eskilstuna, well on the way. They will have 600 people and supply uh, separate the field only for the Swedish battery market. Mm -hmm. And they, will, they have also have extensive research in Uppsala. So, I mean, the, uh, they are bringing good technology, good Asian technology to us, even including production. So we should welcome them. Mm -hmm. I think I agree. But we, there is a risk that we get caught in it. And that I see is the biggest yeah. risk for yeah. large companies like ABB, how well, to cope with that one. But what's the alternative? Yeah. Strategy, I think we, we need to learn because it's... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions? Oh, no, we're many. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so please go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Fu Hao, a master from KTH. 
I have uh, one question to the Professor Lina. And in your presentation, you see we can um, make some effort to extend the equipment lifetime. But uh, I have a question that such as the transformer, it may operation for the uh, 20, uh, 20 or 30 years. And uh, uh, I don't know how can we get the feedback of the, uh, our method is uh, is useful for the life extension or not uh, useful for the life extension. So uh, how can we get the result? Mm -hmm. um, well, on transformers, it, it, a transformer is basically one of the basic, uh, very experienced equipment in, in, in high voltage. So it is very defined standards on testing. So they do testing and typically take a test and send in a lab test. So you, you are following, I guess they have these uh, models that yep. you have, yeah. I think if I just... Yes, yeah, 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 you sorry. made them. That was my old time, <laughs> <laughs> let's come back. First of all, the material uh, in a transformer that is critical is actually the insulation. And it's a paper insulation within oil. And this is a quite fantastic material because it self healed themselves. So even if you get a flash over, it starts to self heal. There is, although the major problem when you see the lifetime, is not them running as normal. If they have not done any uh, short circuit or something out that have damaged them, they can actually stand out for 50, 60, 70 years, as long as you don't touch them, because then the paper start to fall apart. But, that's <laughs> <not> <laughs> that. but the, the major issues normally when you look on a transformer is a short circuit, and then you get a big bang into it, and that is not with the lifetime, and that's very, difficult, but then you need to go there and make a reparation and things like that. So the lifetime of a transformer is extremely high, I would say. Extremely mm -hmm. fascinating product. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hans Jürgen? Or uh, Mikkel, you know this mm -hmm. much better than me. Yeah, on the, <laughs> <laughs> on the yeah, I mean, if, if you have pleasure, you can uh, generate some, some gases and stuff, yeah. there, but that is also that it's controlled, of yeah. course, so, so yeah. it's a very I mean, important component, so yeah. it's very monitored. Uh, going back to monitoring. Yeah, we're learning. I mean, yeah. we, for on the cable, I mean, transformers, I would say, is the most advanced. Yeah. So we are learning from how to do on the cables. Mm. Uh, both me and yeah. Mikkel have been working on the transformer yes. in yes. our old lives. Yes, <laughs> in our old lives. <laughs> Hans Jürgen, do you have a question? Yes, <coughs> I want to pick up uh, Bo's comment on regulations. It isn't a very sexy subject, but a very important one. <laughs> and coming from the pharmaceutical industry, mm which is claimed, and rightly so, to be the most regulated industry on earth. Mm. I have worked there for decades, so I know what we're talking about. And uh, <clears throat> whilst you are sitting in the middle of a regulated system, there are many occasions you dislike, because mm. it stops you, it hinders you, mm. it just puts up hurdles and what have you. Mm. <clears throat> but at the end, when shit hits the fan, mm. sorry, but uh, then you get the value out of it. Mm. For example, second sourcing. <clears throat> I understood that you have some um, um, narrow uh, sectors in the power industry, finding the raw materials, finding second suppliers mm. who could step in when there is a crisis, a war, a pandemic and what have you. And this is commonplace for decades in the pharma industry. We could not face our patients and just saying that we can't find the raw material. And in those rare occasions, there will be an outcry from everyone led by the media, mm -hmm. just uh, complaining about, I mean, you can't leave the patients dying. You have to supply them with life-sustaining medicines. <clears throat> and I'm saying this just to um, get more comments from Bo and the rest mm. of you. Uh, how could you take out the good learnings from mm. a very regulated market and maybe take a step forward, maybe not to the extreme of the mm. pharma industry, because we have different infrastructure and customer base, but um, if you take out the good things. Well, uh, thank you very much for the comment because I think, again, 
regulation in many people is by definition bad. Uh, that's the first thing we have to change, that uh, regulation is not by definition bad. Second comment I will have that uh, you give one example of what uh, the, probably the best things we do is when we can take learning from one industry to, that, to the other, because there we are weak. And I can say the, the power industry is not top notch in everything, I can tell you. So we can probably learn from many other industries how they've solved the different things, including regulation. <laughs> Jonas, you had a question? Yeah, I was thinking about um, um, SF6 gas is used for yeah. insulation. Is that um, uh, a problem that can be solved in the near future or uh, how is it nowadays? Because it's a very potent greenhouse gas. I think what is good here is that none of us work with SF6, <laughs> or? Yeah, somewhat. <laughs> somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, there are alternatives. Uh, I mean, ABB made one example, yeah. AirPlus, and, and uh, yeah, there the are Air, other, yeah. other um, pr proposals from 3M and so on, I think, as well. But uh, it might be that we use uh, very high pressure there in, instead in the end also. But there are alternatives, but uh, of course, SF6 has been used for a very long time, and uh, you know the, how it behaves and how it performs, changing things that you know can look uh, close down the city. Uh, the electricity disappears, and yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, what do you say? It's, uh, I would say it's, it's difficult to uh, introduce new materials. I would say it's awesome. possible to do it with SF6. It's just that it becomes extremely big. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing. It's the, what it reduces actually the improved the dielectric width down. Mm -hmm. So that's what the, the big thing with SF6 is doing. But you can actually, for some application, you see vacuum coming up more and more. Mm -hmm. AVB, as you mentioned, we have something called Air Plus that we are replacing SF6. But when you go up to really high voltage and you want to have a compact solution, mm -hmm. then it's extremely difficult. But you can imagine that you have. Uh, Solid insulator is not bad, that could be. I must say the cable from NKT withstand 640 kilovolts, yeah, yeah. that material. Yeah. Uh, that could be a way forward, for example. If you, But we looked into mm -hmm. that for 10, oh. 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, it was uh, probably too early. Yes. If you can solve some thermal problems instead, uh, then we can make it m yeah. more used to solids instead of the gas. That's an alternative also. Mm. Dina, you yeah, had a I would be too. happy to comment on that, and I think it was a <laughs> brilliant question because normally we say it's only, I mean, that is the, the I think, environmental uh, challenge we have in the power sector is actually the SF6 gas. And I just want to make a reference there that I was, I mentioned in my presentation that we made a study visit uh, very recently with this group, and then we were in Austria and we visited a pump storage. And that was extremely interesting for us to see how they could fast build. Um, and help with storage and so they had um, and the trick here is that if you want to do things fast it's important that you get acceptance from society and and that you can use um, resources you have so in this case this is the alps so they have hydro and you have dams so the only thing they did was to uh, to borrow to uh, to drill to drill a very long drill and then they could increase fantastic a lot of storage and the investment was made by um, German companies that has offshore. So this is a brilliant. But the reason they could do it was because of the SF6 breakers. Because mm -hmm. uh, the acceptance they got was that they could connect to the grid, existing grid, and they could ha kind of hide um, the equipment in the, in the mountain. And in order to make that size, it's the only technology you can do now is SF6. Mm -hmm. so, so that was beautiful everything except these beautiful <laughs> yellow <laughs> as of six breakers. So everyone knows that is the problem. But in order to do this at all now, that's the solution we have. But I think in your opinion, everyone knows this is a challenge. Mm -hmm. So they are working on it. But I think it's normally good to think a little bit that sometimes we need to be fast, sometimes we need to do this. So we are aware about it. And I know they have, mm -hmm. I think they have special uh, actions in European Union to work specifically yeah. on, on as of six. And I would say SF6 is extremely regulated, mm -hmm. that you need to secure that it doesn't have a leakage and things yes. like that. It's follow up extremely. Mm. But it's an, uh, not a nice uh, greenhouse gas.
Mm. Bo, you had also comments. <coughs> well, this is me. I, I usually, when people say we have the technology as our object, so far I haven't done it, but now I will do it, because I, I don't <laughs> think that is correct. We have technologies good enough to build stuff, yeah. but of yeah. course we, need, we, we want we better can. technologies. And mm -hmm. one example, I'm not sure where are you now, Michael? Mm -hmm. When I was in this, we had 20 kilowatts per millimeter. What is it now? Yeah, we can say 30 or something. 30, and mm -hmm. wouldn't you like it to be 60? I mean, in the lab, we would be at 60 exactly. today, but then, I mean, you always need to design with the margin just to, sure. uh, to, to where, know where you are, but... Uh. Yeah, but, but again, uh, I, I share it, but because in a DC capacitor, you have 200. Yeah, yeah. So and why not 200? Thin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't, but I think it's... Uh, uh, don't fool yourself. Uh, we are, there's still mm. things to do to yeah. make things better. Mm. I will just say to expand the grid, we can do it today, but it's a lot of things to do. Yeah. <laughs> yes. hmm. So where do we start there? A lot of things to do. What would you do first? I would say is to work on the uh, losses, because if you can reduce the losses everywhere, I think the HVDC have done a wonderful, uh, incredible journey from the beginning. Do you remember the first losses? Oh, yes. And where it is now, it's like that kind of curve. We were three, three and a half percent. Yeah. And now it's, uh, how much is this? 0.5 or something? The converter. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> I need to <laughs> check it, but it's extremely low. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see what have happened there. And I think in general, if we can improve the efficiency and transport more, we can actually mm -hmm. reduce then the need of energy. And if you can have more and more efficient, and always buying the most efficient mm. uh, product, that's mm. the other thing. Then we can actually make a big difference. Mm. And all the efficiency, I think that's mm. probably the most important things to work on, mm. improve the efficiency. Because then we need less wind power, we need less nuclear, or water, or whatever. So it's actually helping. People are forgetting about this. You normally, when you see the transition, there are three big things that you need to do. One third is working on energy efficiency reduction to solve the CO2 footprint. One third is roughly uh, renewable to introduce that. And then you have one third with a lot of other things to do. But one third is, uh, is the energy efficiency. And very few people speak about it. Most people speak how much more nuclear we need or wind or whatever. That we need for sure. But we need to work on energy efficiency as well. Mm -hmm. It's always easier to spend than to save. Yeah. It applies to, nice to many sectors. In the site, for sure. That yeah. was a good title. <laughs> 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 mm. But, but you know, now, you, now you mentioned bio based, and I mean, that's been mentioned again and again mm. today, like that we need to source free from fossil fuel, right? And we have been discussed it here today as moving away from, from fossil based energy sources. But how about material sources then? I mean, you talk of your crosslink polyethylene mm. cables. I guess they're all fossil based ethylene in there. Yes. So, so what are the opportunities there to go to something more bio-based practice? I mean, what, what we need, I mean, uh, we need the ins insulation capacity. So we need the polyolefins uh, mm. as it is today, uh, unless we should go back to uh, oil and paper. But, <laughs> but, uh, but um, so this can come from, from other sources. I guess there's sugar plants and stuff like that. Uh, you can uh, source uh, polyolefins, but you know, we can not only have sugar plants uh, all over uh, to, to produce the no. these amounts. So one should wisely sort of um, maybe blend in from other sources in and from the mineral oils uh, and so on. But but uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Mm. Where, where can this come from? Because uh, yeah. It's we also need to connect aspect. our, our mm. uh, equipment and, and uh, exactly. energy sources. Mm. Mm. So it's, uh, but if you improve the efficiency, then we need less, of course. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but we still end. need more, as you say, than all sugarcane yeah, yeah. plantations in, yes. in, in the world can supply us with biopolyethylene, mm. of course. It's not even enough for the packaging industry today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I think this is an example because to say zero or 100 percent is uh, dangerous because the last percent can be extremely expensive. Mm. So I think it's more where, because we will need, need fossil stuff somewhere in the mm. system, where we do we need it best? Where, can this, where is, is it more easy to substitute? And if you compare a plastic bag and a 
nice extruded cable, of course, extruded cables should have priority. <laughs> First in line. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all agree on that here on this stage. <laughs> other people may have other opinions. Uh, we're approaching the end of the session. Is there a last question from someone that wants to feed in? Yes, we have one in the back, please. Hello, regarding the efficiency, can you comment on the current state in Sweden of using high voltage direct current tra interconnected transmission lines and also what is the state in Europe for interconnection and what is the roadmap? Thank you. Uh, I have not worked with AFDC for uh, five years ago, so I'm a little bit rusty on that to answer that question directly. I would say, uh, so I want to pause it. That's why I was a little bit, didn't want to say exactly what the losses were. Uh, but the losses is actually defined by the converter. There you have two stations and they are going down. Don't ask me exactly where it is, but it's somewhere uh, between zero and one, and then I don't say anything wrong. <laughs> uh, then you have the cable, and the losses there depends mm. actually on the length of the cable. And so that is also yeah. the important thing. And you have to remember that also a normal AC system have losses. There you have a lot of uh, reactors that actually have uh, impedance. That is also a type of loss. But you also have in the, the power lines losses. And what is interesting is on long distances. And there we did a study from many years ago where you see a cross. When the, it's long distances, then HVDC is normally the best solution, it's always. But if you go to shorter and shorter distances, and on a same time on a cross point, then AC is more interesting to transmit. So it's, uh, that depends a lot of case by case. So, um, but at the same time, say, electricity is probably less losses to transport than anything in the world, actually. So electricity is incredibly low losses when you transport things. And transmission helps you make it possible to build renewable where you have the best resources. Don't forget that. Because it's a big loss if you put up wind turbines where there's no wind. It's much better to put them where there's wind, and then you need transmission. Hmm. With that, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks for joining me here today and for discussing this in detail. I have a really interesting book for you <laughs> to continue the discussion yeah. at home. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Thank you, Mika. Thank you. Lina, you already have a copy, so I don't <laughs> have another one for you. <laughs> so now we need a coffee break. Don't go far, because we're going to resume here back at uh, 1.50. So, but please now have some refreshments up in the main hall where you had the lunch. See you soon. So first, we can welcome uh, Li Sheng Sun. He's with us online, so we'll see here. And I'm not exactly sure where he is in the world, but maybe he will tell us that as well. And uh, he's a specialist. Actually, what he's interested in is, uh, is actually to use artificial photosynthesis. So we are leaving a bit the electrons, but not too much, because we are starting with the photons to the electrons. So we'll do, make a nice trip uh, that way. And he will explain us how to do that. And the guess photosynthesis, we all understand. We have been talking a lot about a lot of molecules this morning, how to make them in a the chemical route. But sometimes there was a question, do we need material? And there were questions asked about that. So the question is, maybe we should let the sun do so and try to see how much we can do, because this is what nature is doing. But we also heard we should do it faster. So with that uh, more, I will take last, uh, the word to, my, to our colleague. Please. Mais dès la renommée de Starta. Yes, we can. Okay, that's great. So first, uh, I'd like to thank Urika for the invitation, and also for uh, putting up a very nice uh, program on the material challenges for a sustainable energy transition. I'd like to share this screen shows that the carbon dioxide uh, concentration in the atmosphere 
Uh, this is the new letter obtained very recently that shows uh, on the March of this year, the average CO2 concentration is about 129 ppm. And comparison last year is 418, the year before last year is 417. So the average global temperature increase during the March 2023 is 1.48 degrees centigrade. This means it became the second warmest March since 1880. So we have a problem. So what should we do? Now we blame that we use too much fossil fuels. We should find alternative technology to convert sustainable energy systems, such as solar energy conversion. In terms of solar energy conversion, our team in the past 30 years has been working very hardly on both solar cells and the solar fuels. For the solar cells, we started with a bi-sensitized solar cell, together with Anders Hapset, Whited Bohlu, Dash Klu, and Whited Axel. So from the center of molecular devices uh, located in KDH and Uppsala University, so we've been working in the past 30 years, not only on the dyes and the solar cells, we also moved to the proscite solar cells. Here, in the proscite solar cells, we encountered a big challenge on the material design. So give you one example of one important material is called whole transport material to keep the proscite solar cells working highly efficient. We need this whole transport material. And typically, for those record efficiencies, Arviscus solar cells, we often use a molecule called uh, a spirometide. This spirometide is a star molecule, but it has a problem. The problem is low charge transport mobility. So you have to use the dopant, such as the lithium or tertiary butyl to keep this uh, high mobility or mobility. But this causes the problem. You see on the left uh, side, uh, the spur you use with the dopant is destroyed the crystal. So the film quality becomes more poor after this. So recently we have designed a new type of whole transport material based on the polymer like polymer one, two, and the three, as I show in the structure on the left and the left. So this polymer, we don't have to use dopant. We call it a dopant free, whole transport material. You can see here, even stay on, on the lab for six weeks, the crystal still looks shiny. And after 40 hours, tap. So with this whole transport material with the polymer, dopant free, you keep the efficiency quite high. Notice now, however, if you use the top uh, uh, spiral ormatad, so to plant more than 50%, okay? So we have also used a tailored design of this top and free whole transport material at a molecular level. For, uh, let's say, uh, they use a transformation lock, as you see here, and then we use this paper stacking and the interfacial anchoring we turn the whole transport material and the crystal interface through the oxygen lead coordination, or through the fluoride lead, or even selenium lead, so you can improve the quality of the crystal and also the performance of the material of the solar cells. So due to the time limitation, I think um, uh, I only show very briefly our research approach for the protocol solar cell. Everybody in the seminar room understand that we don't have 24 hours sunlight. So fortunately or unfortunately, we have day and night. So how to store the solar energy in a suitable way? It's a big challenge. I see it's a big issue. Nowadays, people think they use a battery, like a leasing battery. But that, that's not all of the life. 
if you look at the energy density of a battery and also solar fuels, so here shows you some numbers. Typically, lithium battery, you can make nowadays you better 0 0.23, even 4 or 5 kilocal per kilowatt per hour uh, per uh, uh, kilogram. But this is a far below those solar fuels like ammonia, methanol, acetone, even the green hydrogen. So you have uh, uh, at least 100 times higher in energy density. So we need to consider convert the solar energy directly or indirectly to solar fuel. So what are the technology available or possible scenarios for the technical solutions and material challenges for storing solar energy in the fields? Based on the old uh, oxygen cycle or carbon cycle or nitrogen cycle, I think at least we can make a such a point. Why is it based on the oxygen cycle? So we can use the solar cells, the wind powers, hydro powers, those sustainable energy systems to generate electricity. And then we make water splitting in the electrical life. So this technique is not new. However, the cost so far cannot produce big amount of green hydrogen. New technologies now including uh, AEM. Here A stands for AI exchange membrane technique. By using AEM WE, both water oxidation catalysts, so called OER catalysts, and also the hydrogen generation catalysts, we call it IGER catalysts, you don't have to use all the metals. You don't need uh, ruthenium, nitrogen, iridium, no platinum. They can use the iron, they can use the nickel, they can use the molybdenum. Okay, the first raw transition metals. The challenge is here for the material is how to create stable and strong AI exchange number, so called uh, the, 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 the material challenge. And also, the device challenges here we need an uh, industrial scale style stability at a high current density like one M or even two M per square centimeter. So this is a big challenge. The second one is uh, you use, again, a sustainable energy system from solar, wind, and hydro to make an electrolysis of CO2. So you reduce the carbon dioxide into methanol here, I put the green color here, is you use a, a sustainable energy system to generate CO2 reduction, and then you get uh, methanol, or even acetone, even acetylene. And then you can use uh, the normal transportation technologies in a use on our road. Here, the challenges rely on the CO2 reduction catalyst. And again, the AEM, uh, so-called the membrane. And also the product. Selectivity is also challenging. So far, we have catalysts. We can make CO2 highly selective CO2 product, but now the carbon two plus product. And also, the quality efficiency need to be further improved. For the third one, we are considering to make a, a, a process inside of a Hubble Bosch process. So the Hubble Bosch process is a big energy consumption sector. It consumes more than 1.5% 1. 1. Uh, of the total energy globally used. The way we can do is to use uh, so-called manufacturers to produce fertilizers on-site for agriculture purpose in the field. And again, here we need catalysts. We need the uh, 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 nitrogen reduction catalyst, the, the AM membrane, and also the assembly, membrane assembly. Current density and the fatality efficiency need to further improve. I think today's seminar we have touched the issue of biomass. So the catalytic biomass upgrading is another way to convert uh, energy into a useful fun chemical. Here I give you one example. So on the anode side, 
instead of a water station to generate the oxygen, you can use a yeah, HMF, so a drop of metal uh, for an oxidize it to a friend, a friend dicarbonic acid. Uh, FDCE is a very important monomer for a degradable polymer, uh, the PDF. Uh, the, on the cancer side, you can generate the hydrogen again. But also you can consider to use this technique for generation for another and chemicals with a reduction reaction catalyst. Here the challenge is, uh, uh, is how to lower the lower potential in the flow cell. I think so far I have shown uh, several approaches like uh, hydrogen generation, CO2 reduction, nitrogen fixation, even uh, biomass aggravating. And also you can make an imagination in the future we move into Mars and uh, we can create a new climate of human to survive. Now you need the sunlight, you need water, CO2, and nitrogen, you can generate the amino acid, the fine chemicals, and so on. For those processes to occur in a green way, we need the green electrons and also green photons. But how to generate the green photons and green electrons? But the other way is water, to make water split, so you can get the water oxidation. And this reaction is a highly energy demanding. You need a catalyst. So here, the great challenge is how to create a highly efficient water oxidation catalyst. So maybe we can learn something from nature, so-called natural photosynthesis. Then we can create artificial ones. So here, for the rest of the minutes, I will show you our approach, how to make a molecular and also material catalyst for water oxidation. Like I said, natural water uh, oxidation occurs in uh, enzyme called the photosystem too. This enzyme created about 3.4 billion years ago. So they invented the catalyst as it shows in the next slide here in the middle. So this is a catalyst that can generate uh, water, splitting to get the oxygen, generate uh, electrons, uh, so-called green electrons and the protons, make an A and DPH and the ATP synthase. And the surrounding reaction is a dark reaction to make a hydrogen generation, oxygen reduction, nitrogen fixation, and also the rubisco catalyzer filter reduction. Maybe next slide shows you better how this reaction occurs in nature. So it occurs with the photosystem two in combination with the photosystem one, then ATP reductase, and also ADP, ATP synthase. The structure of water oxidation catalyst is already clear. So thanks for those groups which are hard in this field. However, the reaction mechanism, how does the reaction occur? It's not crystal clear. So nature uses four electron process to figure out the four protons for light. The first photoparasite, the second one, and the third one, in due to the catalyst structure changes has been clearly shown. However, the last photoparasite, the generate a radical, and then take out one proton to get the S prime three state, and then final electron transfer to get as a fourth state. What the structure of S three prime and also S four is not clear. So a lot of groups, including us, uh, put up a lot of proposals, several proposals. And in this one, we propose a chart structure rearrangement in the S3 prime state, and also how the charges are all bound from in the S4 state. So we need a new experimental and also theoretical tools for the, all, all those assumptions. Recent study, we could demonstrate that upon the last photo process, we generate calcium radical. The calcium radical can drive the decarbonation of W1 water to get O2. This triggers the structure structure change. The catalyst is here from the open structure to get to the closed structure. This is very important because this change can bring up a new reaction mechanism for how 
the water is getting oxidized in nature. Yeah, in other words, how the old bond is formed. I think last week, uh, there was a, a, a nature report from the group of Johnny, uh, Mai Singer, Yano, and Yasambara. They have used a uh, so-called X-ray-free electron laser technique. They could demonstrate the structure evidence is for intermediate during this O2 formation. And uh, that is from the S3 state back to S0 state through the S4 state. At the same week, actually in the same issue, Nature reported a uh, work uh, from a group of Guidoni and the Dow. They also used time resolved FTIR and the DFT calculation. So they could demonstrate a, a series of changes during the last scan. And they put up a proposal saying that at the first state is a, a oxygen radical state, which I, I become a really doubtful. Uh, why not uh, the tyrosine generated on uh, O6, not O5, not from the manganese? Now, in other words, so far, the mechanism of water oxidation in nature is still not fully understood. So more experimental evidence is highly needed. So how about the water oxidation by a man-made molecular catalyst? In principle, we can use a similar approach, so-called dimimetric approach. So nature uses four manganese, one calcium. We could also synthesize in the lab four manganese, one calcium. However, Although sometimes the similarity of a man-made cluster in nature is not close, that's it, 90%, but it still does not work as a good catalyst for water creation. Then we change the approach from a biometric approach to bio by the chemical approach. By doing it like this way, we could demonstrate in a simple way, but a highly efficient way to get a particular catalyst for water Oxidation. Uh, one minute, please. Okay, I will uh, try to finish off. So here shows uh, how our, our, our approach made the molecular catalyst, and we do understand the reaction mechanism. We also know how we could modify the structures, the catalyst, and also we know how to make material catalyst uh, by, let's say, holistic or functional mimic, then we can get uh, a material uh, approach for highly efficient, uh, let's say, the final work I showed you here, due to time limitation, I only shows you our recent work that I can get. Now uh, these are designed actual size structure. We could demonstrate how the oral bond is formed with a simple man-made material catalyst. Here, I think the final slide shows how we uh, can get a photoelectron control cell for total water uh, splitting. Uh, we can use a photo anode for water station, photo Kessler for CO2 reduction. Here, the final slide shows you how we could use a sustainable energy system, how to use a material catalyst, use a photo catalyst, uh, uh, electrical catalyst and also photo electrical catalyst to generate, let's say, a carbon neutral society. So, here I would like to take this opportunity to thank our colleagues at the KDH, uh, Stockholm University, Uppsala University, and particularly the Swedish Consortium for Artificial Photosynthesis. So, finally, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, there's nobody in the chat, but there are many people in the room. So, yes, Yunus. Yes, you found the microphone. Excellent. I found the microphone, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, so, today, most of the installed uh, solar panels, they are made from silicon, and they uh, are stable for at least 10 years, right? When can we... When, when do you think it can be feasible to make uh, panels out of perovskite material to um, have the same stability? 
Stability issue for post solar cells is now a, a really big challenge for the community. People want to work hard. We improve the stability. One way to do is to uh, make uh, uh, inorganic cross cut instead of methyl, methyl ammonium, ammonium, we can use a cesium, we can use other inorganic cations. So the stability could improve due to the phase stability of cross cut. However, uh, the efficiency is that to be further improved. Thank you. Is there more questions? Yes, a gentleman in the, in the back. Uh, hi. So, uh, like, uh, you were researching on uh, spirometad. Uh, have you ever tried using carbon nanotubes with spirometad in peroxide itself, so to increase the mobility of electrons? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I can get your question to repeat it. It was about the, uh, the use of carbon nanotube um, to improve performance and stability. Uh, carbon nanotube for stability. Um, uh, not really for uh, the purpose of solar cells, but uh, you can use it for solar fuel. Uh, carbon nanotube is uh, a really good uh, uh, substrate for catalyst to load ions. And with carbon nanotube or graphene in general, the material, uh, the performance of uh, total uh, electrochemical water splitting has been dramatically improved uh, in comparison with those uh, cells without a carbon based material. So, carbon nanotube is a really good material to talk. Thank you. And we'll take the last question, Joy Deep here. Yeah, uh, Professor Sun, very nice uh, talk. My name is Joydeep Datta from KTH. Uh, molecular catalysts, we know they are uh, excellent for one-time use. Uh, how do you think molecular catalysts will shape up for sustainable environmental <laughs> applications? Yes, Professor uh, Dutta, it's a very good question. Uh, Molecular, molecular catalysis is really excellent, as I show you. Because due to time limitation, I don't have time to show the movie experiment. So now we have molecular catalyst with a tensile work frequency more than 1,000 per second. This means it's more efficient, higher efficiency than natural photosynthesis. Uh, natural photosynthesis has 300 to 400 per second. So how to shape up uh, uh, the, the molecular catalysts in the real applications, in device? Uh, I don't believe we can use molecular catalysts for the hot style. What I mean hot style means uh, like a photo anode. Uh, but uh, we can consider to use molecular catalysts in the uh, so cells, in the vesicle type of cells across the membrane. And then molecular catalysts can play a really big role. Thank you. I think we're, we can stop here and give a round of applause to our speaker. Okay, thank you. And we'll move to the next speaker, it's Professor Belova. And uh, her interests are into experimental neuroscience, and she has been working with a lot of things except energy. But today she comes, like all good researchers, to understand that energy is so important that we have to contribute all of it. And in particular, she is very good at using 3D printing layers to try to make new things of what we need. So, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Just so it's clear, it's not the 3D printing in a conventional sense, like printing with plastics. We're using inkjet technology, among other things. But today, I'm going to be talking about inkjet specifically. So we are in the energy field actually for a fairly short time. We just entered fairly recently. We've been doing quite a lot of things, mostly electronics based for different purposes, data storage, recording, other things. So um, this is somewhat new, but um, we thought that we could contribute by our knowledge. So to explain a little bit our motivation, I've been looking around and um, uh, the statistics came by, so I guess everybody knows that, but it's kind of nice to put things in the numbers. 
is that although a significant fraction of the worldwide use of electricity actually comes from renewable sources, but the total energy, the layout is quite different. So it's still fossil fuels, which really, really dominates 84.3%. And although it's going down a little bit, it says here that in 2000 it was 86, but it's really, really small reduction. So if we look, and this is taken from the Energy in um, the data from Sweden, then solar power is actually this tiny little pair here. <laughs> so it's really, really small contribution. And here you can see uh, on the supply, it's it's really very, very small. But it, it appears to be growing, and um, st statistics here is between 20 and 21. You can see that uh, there is a 46% increase just in one year, and it seems to be getting even better, like this year, we noticed that now almost every other house has solar panels on them, at least in the Stockholm area, and uh, we've been using ours for about eight years, and they're working great. <laughs> So it's, uh, it seems to be a progress. But if we look um, at what happened in the recent years, and especially with the pandemic, and we show, we, I think we've all seen a lot of different vulnerabilities, for example, in the supply chains. So we certainly produce energy, including solar-based energy locally, but what about the devices themselves, the modules, the cells, um, and I guess that is true in all the other parts, in, in terms of parts and materials and other things. So if we look just as an example at the, at the silicon solar cells, it's a mature technology, it's very nice, it's very well tasted, very reliable, it lasts for some years. It has relatively high efficiency, although that depends, I guess, on which field you look in. I mean, for solar, I mean, this is considered to be fairly high efficiency. For some of the other fields we saw yesterday, they were talking about 76% efficiency, so that's a matter of interpretation. But if we look at some of the things like, for example, production, production involves very high temperatures, above 1500 C. So the energy investments is very big, and considering the previous slide, it's probably fossil energy that gets into this production simply because that's the majority of the energy. So in order to produce green energy, we seem to be investing a lot of fossil energy, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Then uh, there are quite significant quantities of toxic byproducts from the production, like, for example, silicon tetrachloride. There is also a substantial amount of waste, so if we think of what happens to these modules after they're done, they mostly end up on the landfill, because it's mostly glass, which is cheap, so people choose to just throw them away rather than try to recycle them. So we're actually generating landfills and landfills and landfills considering the area of waste from that. So there seems to be an objective need to reduce energy investment in the production so that we don't invest sort of dirty energy to produce clean energy. Uh, it would be nice to, to be able to produce uh, these things locally in a feasible way because we know that, of course, it's driven by the cost and also minimize the amount of different toxic byproducts and amount of waste, hopefully, if possible. It is also would be nice to reduce the amount of materials uh, so that we are cautious about um, utilization of, in principle, the materials, as well as, as, as well as look into more sustainable selection of materials. So this is where we thought that we could contribute with um, Injet to produce all printed energy sources. So just to take a step back, we all know about injets because 40 years ago we used to go to a studio to, uh, to a chemical lab rather, to process photographs. Now we just push a print button and we get very, very nice high quality photo. So injet technology has been around for a while. It's very mature and it's uh, generally, uh, these devices can be continuous injet, which are basically just firing in continuously and then the uh, you, you have some kind of a motion over the substrate to produce a pattern. And uh, then there is drop on demand in jets. And continuous in jets are, are nice and they're actually used in industrial processes, but they're, they're still, you can't really have full control over the process. So it's more interesting to use uh, the drop on demand. And then there is still a lot of variety depending on the type of printing, like thermal printers, for example, 
they heat the ink to uh, change the viscosity to form the droplet. Then airbrush is using some kind of aerosol, so they spray the ink. Electrostatic and then piezoelectric. So the piezoelectric and jets are the most interesting for material production, specifically for functional materials because they don't introduce any thermal stress or electrostatic charges on the material. So they're just more neutral to the materials in principle, and you can use them in um, combination with more materials. So this is actually our own group's history, in some way, of the injets. So a lot of materials are printable, including carbon nanotubes that have been mentioned <laughs> just recently, and certainly oxide materials. We worked with UV curable adhesives, magnetic nanostructures, um, conductive polymers, different ceramic coatings. So the, the field of use is actually already fairly developed, even though when it comes to commercial use in terms of functional materials, it's still not as advanced as it could have been. Just to give a couple of examples, um, this is an example for the carbon nanotubes, in this case, single wall carbon nanotubes. So you can see here uh, a pattern it can be done as a circuit board, for example. So if you print a pattern like that on a paper, just regular paper, then you can fold it and unfold it and fold it again and unfold it again, and it will still be a working circuit. So it's, um, um, it's compatible with a lot of unusual substrates, unusual from the scientist's perspective because we seldom work with paper as a substrate. But together with that, it, it enables a whole new range of materials as a combination with different devices. And then another example just to show the level of control that you can get. This is an example of a protein, actually, that we used once upon a time for, uh, to create different bioinorganic interfaces. So this is a fairly big pattern. Well, these are actually two drops next to each other and four drops next to each other, fairly big ones. This is a large volume print head. But you can see that by tuning the parameters, you can actually get a single monolayer. And these are very, very small proteins. And even at the edge, which looks like a coffee stain, which is a very common effect when you have drying liquids on the surface, all the way to the edge, it's a very, very nice uh, single monolayer of molecules. So you have very, very high degree of control, which is counterintuitive when you're talking about such a big thing like an inject that you can get very, very uh, small uh, structures inside the print and also very, very thin layers. So for the photovoltaic devices, we cautiously from the very beginning made some choices. So first of all, we didn't want any exotic or rare materials for obvious reasons from the sustainability perspective and, and also just from the usage, regular usage perspective. Uh, in design, we wanted to target stability, and together with that, we had a vision of trying to simplify the ease of use just from the application's perspective. We're using two types of inks, suspension inks and solution inks. So it kind of looks simple that you press a button, et cetera, but actually it's, it's much more complicated than that. There are a lot of chemists here that can appreciate the complexity of a stable suspension. <laughs> And I'm a physicist, so I can appreciate the complexity much better than that, actually. So it's, it's, it's a lot of knowledge of uh, chemistry and surface chemistry and surface physics that you need to do to put this together so that it really works. Uh, but the nice combination is that we are actually able to use the solution-based inks. That means that we don't have to synthesize nanoparticles every time we need to change a material we can actually work with precursors and we can trigger reactions for some of the materials directly on the surface. Then we wanted to uh, reduce the overall processing temperatures as much as possible, and that is from the energy investment standpoint. Now, I think the, uh, the, the old pr for, the, for the old prints itself that we're making, we've managed to push it down to 200 degrees. So compared to 1500, that's not too bad. We didn't want any vacuum technology, we didn't want in a clean room of glove box. That is a big challenge because we're working with perovskite solar cells, and I think everybody knows that perovskites are extremely sensitive to air, and especially humidity in the air. So this is actually, it's, it's not a simple challenge to tackle, but we, we wanted it to be from the, again, from the usage perspective, because we wanted to have this technology 
contribute to availability of the energy sources. And that means that it needs to be able to be produced easily. And then we wanted to also have some design simplifications in the process. So what would be the advantages of such a technology? First of all, it's a scalable technique. Uh, there are industrial level printers already. The productivity is fairly high. They can deliver about 50 meters per minute. And you can have widths of at least five meters at a time. So, and you can also use multiple print heads. It means that you can make multi-layers in essentially very rapid process, just one after the other. Then the reason of some of these choices, we wanted to have this technology to be adaptable to on-site fabrication. And it doesn't have to be large, large scale. So you don't have a very big chemical plant to produce such technology. You can do it small scale, you can have a farm somewhere when you can go in a room and just make yourself another solar panel if you need one. So this is the reason for the lot of these choices that we made from the very beginning. Then, of course, it's a low cost and a lot, very low energy investment fabrication, so the injets, they don't consume a lot of power, we all know that. There is also a substantial decrease of the material use, simply because of, the, of this uh, drop on demand. We only print when and where we want it, so all of the ink gets used. So as compared to, for example, spin coating, which is frequently used in perovskite solar cells, the waste of the material is about 90%. So you can... Um, certainly appreciate that part. So that would be a significant impact on sustainability of just the fabrication process. Then, of course, this process, with after all of these numerous steps are hopefully completed, then it can be designed to be relatively simple. And then, then it could be a very light, uh, lightweight, thin devices, so you can put them on plastic, not necessarily on on uh, solid surfaces, you can make them bendable, you can maybe wrap them around uh, poles rather than making flat, uh, uh, very large area devices. Right, so um, I've put in some publications to people that want to know some details. So we started off, um, of course we had to do layer by layer to establish reference points to the conventional devices. We started off by using uh, titanium oxide, and uh, then also um, mesoporous structure. Then we have discarded the mesoporous structures because they produced substantially high hysteresis. So we started to, and this was also kind of helping to simplify the devices. This is an example of, for example, a transport layer, how it looks with the inkjet. One of the nice things that working with the liquid techniques compared to the physical deposition techniques is that they actually um, sort of smoothen the edges of the extremely rough FTO surfaces, so you can actually improve the interface quite a lot, which is very important in, in the perovskite structures. So you can see that you can get very nice crystalline material, which is very thin, so in this case it's 50 nanometers, and it's very homogeneous across very large surfaces. So this is an example of the tin oxide-based solar cell, and th these are the IV curves. Here, you, you might think that the uh, efficiency is a little bit low, but we made references at every point. So the conventional spin-coated device had pretty much the same efficiency, so that was limited by the precursors and other things. So the challenges, of course, are still there. So the sensitivity of the perovskite to the air and humidity is still there, which means that the in-air designed uh, all printed devices have a little bit lower uh, productivity, but together with that, it's possible to tune microstructure of the perovskite, which is not really possible to do with the spin coating. So there is a lot of uh, possibilities for designing there. Uh, we've, we've started to get into development of protective layers to improve stability, and we want to replace the gold of the metal contact. Not, not just for the material consideration, but just metal colloids are not very easy. So we, we got some initial good results from um, uh, graphene and uh, carbon. So we've already discussed this so many times that the production grows and talking about the storage. Considering the previous talk, I'm not going to get into details at all. But we thought that maybe we will try to use also, since a lot of the materials are very, very similar, to uh, see if we can uh, create something useful for photocatalytic water splitting. And this is actually a, a viable process. There is a, a pilot facility close to Tokyo 
which is run in partnership with some uh, companies. But uh, they're using platina-based or noble, noble metal-based catalysts. So um, this, is, of course, is, is, it can be an efficient technology, but it's very expensive for large-scale production for obvious reasons, because the most efficient catalysts are all platina-based or rare, rare materials. And then there can be issues also for some of the more efficient um, catalysts with reproducibility, long-term stability, process scalability, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we started off just by using titanium oxide, and uh, we made these kind of dense but ultra-porous films um, of titanium oxide. And then uh, we, when we measured the, catalytic, the photocatalytic activity and compared them to the other layers, of course, you cannot compare them to just loose powder, but to layers, we already got an improvement of 30% of the photocatalytic activity. So now we have taken it a little bit um, further. We've started to play with co-catalysts. So um, this is very, very preliminary, but it looks like when we look at the hydrogen production, and of course, this is uh, very attractive because um, here you can have very large surfaces with very, very little material. I mean, this is just a couple of microns, two and a half microns, the thickness of this material. Um, these uh, techniques can be integrated with the other uh, hydrogen production methods, for example, with electrolysis, and that would overall decrease the energy investment for the hydrogen production because here you're just using sun. And then they can also be used for water purifications, we've also heard today. And uh, these films have also very high mechanical stability compared with the other films that we've, we've actually abused them a little bit because we had like a rotating magnet on top of them when we ran the measurements. And they can be regenerated, so you can take them out, you can anneal them out, burn, burn off the carbon, and you can use them again. So now we're working with the co catalyst, so we've actually managed to increase the productivity further around 100 times something, so it's, it seems to be going quite well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have uh, some time for questions. Uh, you know, do you see somebody online or? Uh, not at the moment. Not at the moment, so I think. Uh, in the room, please. The gentleman over there, yes. What is the readiness of the technology like for the uh, piezoelectric deposition? Uh, that depends. So the, the technology for the, for the injured technology is there already. It's, it's an industrial process. The only thing is that the, uh, the large scale industrial process is for regular inks with papers. So it's a, or, or with tiles. I mean, there's ceramic technology with fabrics. I mean, most of these very nice, these are all digital printing, these are all injets. So this technology is, is, is ready. But for materials, then it's a little bit more complex issue. There are some startups that popped up for electronics purposes. There are certainly a few startups that are making inks because the research field is very big. Um, but that's sort of what it is now. Large, large scale businesses are not yet there to the best of my knowledge. But there are some startups. Exciting, exciting. Your dip, please. Yeah, I can add up to this. Uh, basically, inkjet printing is not new. And in solar cells, I have seen uh, plants uh, with make, when they were doing polymer solar cells. 20 years back, I've seen that in US when they were making roll-to-roll -roll solar cells. Mm -hmm. So the uh, inkjet printing has been used in uh, solar cell manufacturing. And when we were doing roll-to-roll -roll solar cells, including amorphous silicon technology, which died, unfortunately, uh, it was already there. So it's not very new. So it's in perovskites I have not seen, because I'm out of that for a while. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Well, at least uh, there is some experience to upscale because this, yeah. of course, is the next challenge. We have a few, ten, few minutes for more questions. Uh, uh, you already asked one, so I just let me check if somebody else wants to ask. If not, the, the word is yours. Again. Just asking about the like readiness of the perovskite inks like that if we can use for this.
Well, the the uh, the full scale has not completed yet, at least from our side. I'm not entirely sure because there there are several groups that are working in parallel on different parts. There are also some groups that are working on parts of the cells being with with Injet. Uh, from that, the only thing that I know that there is one startup in Poland that is uh, uh, trying to develop a complete package, but it's very hard to tell sort of how far it is because the information is very scarce. So it's obviously ready enough to be tried, but in terms of commercial products, I'm not aware of any. Thank you. Yeah, upscaling is of course uh, uh, where the next challenge lies, so it's a good question and uh, uh, maybe that's another day of discussion, how do we upscale? Well, and of course the stability, because the long-term yes. stability is still not resolved. No, but we can test that at Ketich on the roof of the living lab, eh? there as you go. we have heard very recently. <laughs> so we should all climb this also one day to try to see that. Uh, we have uh, one more minute for another question, if somebody is... Well, just then I can't take the last question. You produce hydrogen photocatalytically, that's very exciting, but how do you collect the hydrogen? Because you will have this 10 by 10 kilometers of panels. How right. do you connect? Uh, how do you collect all the molecules we to have, use them? We have not gone that far <laughs> quite yet. So yes. this, this, in, the, in, in this, we hope to collaborate. Actually, we collaborate with a group in Spain mm -hmm. that are actually experts on hydrogen specifically, yes. because hydrogen is also very difficult to measure. Yes. As we all know. But so and, very, and very easy to lose. And very easy to lose, so. exactly. So we, we're actually hoping um, mm. to make a small lab reactor together with them where we will be making the active modules. Yes. And then they will do the collection. And part. we'll be very, all very happy if you don't do large-scale testing at KTH campus. I with hydrogen, uh, we had already bad experience. Yes, <laughs> so probably You had not. it in your building already. Probably <laughs> not. Yes. No. Thank you so much. So I thank would you. like to extend you this nice book. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll give the hand to Lina for the next part of the program. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes? I think so? Good. Uh, no. No. The micro is off. Yes, no, now it's on. on. Good. So um, we are now uh, reaching the final uh, panel, uh, final session here. And I'm very happy to announce our three speakers. So I start with our uh, new guest on the floor. That's Annika Ramschild. Uh, she's the vice president of corporate sustainability at Vattenfall. And she just was awarded one of the most um, um, powerful people in, in sustainability in Sweden, that's very nice. And she has a very long experience at Vattenfall working on strategic areas. And she also have a master from KDH. So we're very happy that you're here with us. So welcome. <laughs> and then I'm welcoming back uh, Bo Normark and Joy Deep uh, to them. So uh, in this... <laughs> In this closing uh, session, we would like to make a little bit outlook for future and see also what we have learned today and what we will take away. And of course, we are very exciting to hear your view, Annika. So I ask you kindly to start to give your uh, reflection on the topic for today and on how you think about this related to your work at Vattenfall. Well, first of all, like we've heard today, I mean, materials are going to be very critical in, in doing the transformation. And I think you've touched on material, the importance of materials when it comes to storing energy, the importance of, of, of materials in ensuring that we are producing the electricity I in a good way. So, so I think f from a Vattenfall point of view, I think two key, key areas really uh, when we look at the entire system. We do need to be able to produce uh, electricity more efficiently and I'm so excited to hear about all the, the new ways of using the solar energy to produce hydrogen. And, and hydrogen is going to be very key in the entire transformation that we are in moving away from the fossil fuels to the fossil free 
uh, ones. And then, uh, and, and I can come back on, on a number of exciting projects that we have ongoing where we are using hydrogen. So to find good ways, not only through ordinary electrolysis, to produce hydrogen is going to be absolutely key and to do that in a good way. But then the materials are key when it comes to all the wind power, all the solar power and so forth that we're going to use. We need to ensure that they are, I like you talked about that they need to be designed so that you can recycle the materials in a much better way. And, and there are, we need to think of every single step in, in the chain and the materials are going to be the key in all of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, so Bo Normark, what would you like to share with us for future? Well, I, I showed you a 30-year-old vision. Uh, that is almost done. Uh, we're not far away. Uh, so I think we need to uh, create another vision. Uh, and of course, uh, when it comes to materials, well, one thing I learned there, uh, anything that you produce, anything, if you produce it in large enough volumes, the cost is actually one and a half time material price. Which boils down to that we need to learn to, uh, to have cheaper materials. Uh, that's because I, once again, I come back to, I disagree when people say we, everything is here. Of course, if I work in industry, I would say we have everything. I would challenge that again and said we don't have it, it can be better. And one thing that is uh, substitution of materials actually, uh, where we can use um, uh, less, uh, I would say, less scarce materials. And uh, that I've been following very closely in, in the battery space where it's it's a wide space there of ideas how you can build batteries that are, have less, uh, I would say, scarce materials. That is not to say that we shouldn't use what we have today. Uh, read me right there, but uh, we should never give up to try to, to see how we can use um, uh, materials better and more abundant materials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Jordi? Yeah, it's been uh, very nice. We got the industrial view. We got the centrist view. I'll give you the academic view. Having new materials is fantastic, but building up new materials takes a lot of effort, time, and there is very little investments focused on that to build it up. Talking about using the sun and the hydrogen, yes, in the academia we keep doing it, but as an academic, I can tell you, it's not worth it. Because the amount you'd produce would not suffice to your industrial needs. Okay? So similarly, I think what we need to do, uh, these uh, for, uh, you know, formats are very nice. We need to build up an industry academia uh, conversation, more detail, more heart to heart, so that your needs becomes our dream and our students deliver that dream into developing us into the new generation of devices and systems as you're talking about. Hmm? That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayed. So, Annika, would you like to make a comment on this, maybe? Well, I, I, I fully agree. I think we need, in order for us to speed and, and get the speed up as is needed, we need to work much more uh, closely together. And I think a lot of the industries like ABB and, and Vattenfall and others, we have the R&D units that collaborate quite closely to a lot of different universities. And I think we can most likely scale up much more on that piece. But I think we, and there, I think we have a role from both sides to dare to challenge each other and, and, and uh, also look at what can be done and understand each other maybe more than we've done earlier. Uh, but, but I do think there is a lot of benefit to working uh, much closer together. And, and there are now, I, I would say that there, we are forming so many different type of, of collaborations where it's both companies, politicians and academia working together with joint visions on where we want to go and then actually work together on, on developing, for instance, technologies around hydrogen. So I, I, but me might be able to be much more precise on those things. So I guess, uh, Bo, will you have a comment on this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, of course, I, mm. and I would add one more mm. dimension because what we have learned, not the least in Sweden, that uh, uh, there is another dimension, and that is how startup companies can work together with both academia and uh, traditional industries. Uh, and that uh, has 
is a very powerful tool actually if you can can keep the spirit in the small company with the so so with the resources and the, the deep knowledge in, in mature companies i think that's the way to go and uh, uh, fortunately we, we have it is coming back to money again because uh, we have seen a, a very positive development actually in sweden in, in the last 10 years particularly that that um, we see new type of capital coming in uh, and uh, we see a lot of actually foreign capital coming into Sweden, which we should be very happy and embrace uh, because uh, uh, come back to this notion of taking risks. I mean, how much risk can you take if you want to move fast? And uh, that I think there is a good development, but it of course could come much further. Sometimes also I think academia has a role to play that <clears throat> when uh, but we are dreaming a little too much, you can come back and say, hey, come on, I've done the math here. <laughs> it doesn't work out. <laughs> we need that sometime close. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So I was thinking we can take the opportunity to bring up a couple of comments from the audience. So is there anything you'd like to ask or contribute with? Jonas, yes. Yes, there is now a Wallenberg program called the WISE program, mm -hmm. and uh, they have these uh, research arenas. Mm -hmm. So do you see that forming one arena around uh, potentially hydrogen production, could that be of interest to Vattenfall, or what, what do you think, Anninga? I think this is one way of, of doing it, uh, absolutely, because we do need some arenas. Then it's always difficult to understand which is going to be the silver bullet one. But, but I think maybe more coming back to you, your view, sort of how do we get uh, all, also the students to understand why we're there. I think we need to really show that the new technologies are being used and deployed very quickly. Mm -hmm. And if I just look at some of the projects we have ongoing in Vattenfall, I mean, it's everything from that we are now testing wooden towers for wind turbines, try to test that. Or we mm. do the, the test with, with having the hydrogen storage things. We bring in different type of components and testing and testing. And I think it's by showing that we dare to pilot different things and then see that anything that comes from academia, any new things, are actually being used and deployed. I, I think here it's also up to us as industries to start acting in a different way. We always used to do everything on big scale and everything should be fixed at the same time. But what we do much more now is that, okay, we have, if we take a big uh, wind farm field, then we decide that we take, test some technology in one of the turbines, we take, test something else in another and so forth. And then, we can, then it's easier to bring in those things from, from uh, academia and, and things that are on the way to be developed. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Is it any other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Yeah, my name is Jin Zampan, professor in chemistry at KTH. Uh, I was thinking, because people talk about transition, so what do you do with all this infrastructure already existing? For instance, oil and gas industry, all the pipelines, can you just get rid of them, and <laughs> it's a huge cost. But uh, what I know, some industry is striving to try to uh, reuse this in another way. For instance, use the, uh, the oil and gas, the old pipelines, even the, the, the wells to, for carbon capture. And also the, the pipelines that people are testing for using for the hydrogen transport, in the gas phase transport. But uh, I, I don't know how, how mm -hmm. that part, I mean, your mm -hmm. idea, is that good idea Good idea should be encouraged to do or just try to find completely new ideas? I, th I think you're really onto something because we need to be very ro resource efficient. And if I'm, we should absolutely use the, the existing infrastructure. Oftentimes you might not be able to use it right off. But, but just looking at, again, what, what's happening in, in a lot of places where we have now sort of shut down coal plants or other things, that's when we instead then build other uh, new things, be it then uh, wind power or, 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 or solar powers or whatever. And also when we have a site where you already have the grid infrastructure in particular, then you secure that you put everything in the same spot. So very often now in, in Europe we develop, so we have wind, solar and batteries in the same spot so that we can use that electricity infrastructure at least in the most efficient way. 
uh, when it comes to gases, then if we talk about hydrogen, like we spoke earlier, it's a molecule that has a tendency to really run off. So, so there, in order to use that infrastructure, we need to be a bit clever. But here I know there is a person that <laughs> <laughs> wants to yeah, talk no, about I mean, that. So. No, I, uh, <laughs> sometimes you have to, to realise that uh, game over. Uh, to put it, because I mean, for, for gas pipelines, uh, I'm uh, very pessimistic yeah. because I'm, I don't think it's a great idea to reuse the gas pipeline by producing hydrogen to produce heat in homes with hydrogen. It's much better to use electricity right away and use heat pump. So uh, it's, of course, we should try to reuse, but there are limits. Where it's possible. And, uh, very, very it's possible. So I yeah. can just add up indeed, yeah. one <laughs> comment to that. Mm -hmm. Bo, if you really look at how the gas was supplied, it started all in London. 25% of that cooking gas yeah. was hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the reasons why in uh, New York now, they are thinking about putting hydrogen in their gas pipes as well. So it can be reused in some areas. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, of course, I mean, the industry, they know if it's not, uh, cannot be used, they will not use that one. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you try to check within the reasonable cost limit, mm -hmm. so if you can reuse, for instance, some of the pipelines mm -hmm. now can be uh, mm -hmm. used to, for the transport of hydrogen gas phase, then there are other issues, there are other challenges, like hydrogen can cause embrittlement of metals, mm -hmm. and that needs some further research or even some further development, find the more suitable materials. And no. that kind of research, I don't know. In some countries, it's quite uh, hot. But uh, in Sweden, I think uh, there's no such ac activities. Well, it's a good, uh, I mean, it's a good proposal, I think, mm -hmm. for future. But I think some industries have done a lot. I mean, if you look at the transportation sector, mm -hmm. if you look at Scania, yeah. for example, a lot of them have already shifted yeah. in the production. So I think in mm -hmm. industry, a lot of things have done, been done. But I, I, I totally agree in research. Maybe this would be an exciting topic. But I think to build mm. on what Bu said is that, again, the infrastructure where we mm. need the gas for the future is not the places where we have the current mm. gas infrastructure, and that is a problem. Mm. And then, of mm. course, it's the question, can you then move it somewhere else? Mm. Uh, and then you need to think of, is it worth it with also the transportation cost and the retrofitting that you need to do, or could you rather recycle that material in a smarter way and, and build it so that it's really fit for purpose? So I think, of course, the, the holistic and circular way of thinking, that absolutely has to be there. But then mm. we need to be smart in, in doing the right designing and mm. use the right things in the right spots. So I think we're kind of getting ready now for the final comment. Would you like to take one final comment from the panel? Thank you. Maybe Yoidi, would you like to start? Uh, <laughs> always ladies first. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. But, but now you have the chance. <laughs> yeah, Academia exactly. go first. <laughs> exactly. mm. That's where okay. it starts, all the bright ideas. Uh, so I think uh, talking about the bright ideas, uh, what Bo has come up uh, with, uh, creating this infrastructure of having you know, uh, small companies interfacing between larger entities like uh, Vattenfall, that is an absolute must. I, I, I believe in Sweden we are in the right direction in that. But the other way around, in what are the industrial needs could be more direct <coughs> into the academia that could uh, you know allow us to accelerate much faster because after all we are a small country so more better knit and we could take the advantage of this to build up the industrial empires uh, even stronger for the future that's that's what i think it's not about materials it's not about energy End of the day, it's all about profitability. And how do we uh, you know, continue to grow our sustainable industries? That could be the way out, two-way process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Boo? Well, Maite, I think I, I've been able to, to spell out uh, most, of what, most of my ideas already. I t one thing I take away, I love that people have an invention that makes it simpler. Uh, I love your idea about making electrolyzer without separator because then you take Thank away you. something. Thank and you. that's always a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. <laughs> and, and, and I think w w now we have uh, looked at different individual things and materials and so forth, but, but also a, a general 
thing is that we need to understand that today, in order to be circular and really use all the materials in an efficient way, we need to start and thinking f all the way, like you've already pointed out today, from design to, to uh, assembly, manufacturing, end of life, how do we secure that we use things in an efficient way? And if preferably also thinking about already at the end of life, how can that be used in a smart way? So it's really the system thinking and the ecosystem that we need to think of. And I think also if I want to make a wish in particular out to academia is to, it's excellent that you're very focused on, on, on your specific things, but try sometimes also to think a bit broader on how can it also come into other applications, other purposes, how can you reinvent the things that are all there, already there to make use of them even better. Because it is in this ecosystem, we need to optimize the ecosystem, we cannot optimize small different pieces anymore, that those days are gone, because then we are too slow in moving in the right direction. Beautiful last comment. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Annika, thank you so much. Thank you. So now it's time for us to close the session for today. And I think Annika made a brilliant comment that's really relating to the session today because it's a collaboration here between the energy and um, uh, material <laughs> platforms of KDH. And I think that is exactly what we're trying to achieve, actually, is that we have these specialist research scientific groups, and then we try to meet crossover. And a lot of things, that's at least how we see it, is that we are reusing some material, some results we have in different applications. So I think that is what we are trying to achieve, really. Uh, we are very happy that all of you are here today, and many people are digital. And we um, would like to thank everyone here. Um, we are preparing some documentation uh, from today that we will share with all of you. And um, we hope to see you uh, again many places, maybe on 30 of November and maybe in other places too, and to continue the dialogues. Would you like to add something, Johan? I think you summed it up all mm. very good. I just want to say that uh, we're really happy for all the ver very good talks that we have had today and the fruitful, fruitful discussions. So it's been a very enjoyable time here. And uh, thank you very much, all of you. Yes, and thank you, Rika, for mm -hmm. fixing the venue. Yes. I think this was a very nice place. Thanks, yes. Eva, for just yes. being here. We should, very happy. We should thank Eva also <laughs> for that. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.